first speaker up, uh, Dr. Catherine Talcott, is going to talk to us about advanced dry AMD treatments, where are we, where we are, and where we're going. Thank you. Thanks so much for the introduction. So happy to be speaking here. Um, and I agree, let's make this interactive. So if you have any questions, please ask me. And if I don't know the answers to them, I'm going to refer you to Peter Kaiser, who's two seats to my uh, left, who knows a lot more about every GA treatment that there is out there. So here are my disclosures. So as we know, there have been significant breakthroughs and continued improvements in the treatment of neovascular AMD. We're lucky to have sort of multiple anti-VEGF injections, recent approval of Sysvimo, which has been really exciting. But what we're really lacking is sort of, um, despite sort of having all these advanced and as, ad, advancements and treatments for neovascular AMD, we really need stuff for geo, ge, ge, geographic atrophy. Um, and here's some representative images of a patient who I've been seeing over the past three years. And, Sort of, it's just a really sad disease that we just don't have great treatment for. So, you know, I'm excited to talk about that there's several potential treatments that are currently under investigation. And the patient that I showed here is one of mine. She's 61, and she has count fingers vision in one eye. In the other eye, she's still 20-20, but you can see that she has extrafovea lesions. And she's kind of what I consider to be sort of the perfect candidate who's really waiting for treatment to be there. She's got a lot of life still ahead of her, and we're really sort of need treatment options. So obviously this is a pretty big topic to cover in 10 minutes, so I'm really going to just provide sort of a broad overview of not everything, but some of the um, exciting things in the GE therapeutic pipeline. So I sort of organized this talk by mechanism. Um, so first I'll be talking about complement inhibition. So I don't know about you, but the last time that I really sort of thought about the complement pathway was when I studied for step one in med school, and then I assumed that I would just be able to dump that information and never use it again. But life has a sense of humor, and here we are talking about different pathways again. So things to sort of know about the complement sort of system and how it affects like GA, it's been implicated in GA by uh, genetics where different variants have been associated with geographic atrophy. And basically there's activation of C3, which leads to cleavage of C5, which in the setting of geographic atrophy can lead to sort of inflammation and, 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 and cell death. So let's talk about sort of where we've been first. So, so, so lampalizumab, as most people probably know in the audience, was a complement factor D in, in, in inhibitor, and despite showing sort of earlier promise, it unfortunately failed to show efficacy in the two major phase three studies. So patients got these injections every four or six weeks, and at the end of the 48 weeks in the two sort of pivotal trials, there was unfortunately no benefit in geographic atrophy size um, when, when compared to the treatment arms. Um, and so that's sort of the baseline that most of these studies look at, so we'll sort of be going back to that sort of as an endpoint. But we're fortunate in that there's other things still in the pipelines, um, and some of which have really promising um, re results so far. So APL um, is a pegylated cyc uh, cyclic peptide inhibitor of complement C3. Uh, the phase two Philly study randomized patients to either get injections monthly or, or, or every other month over a 12-month period and then had a six-month follow-up period. And they found that the growth rate of, of GA on fundus autofluorescence decreased by 29% and, 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 and 20 in the monthly and every other month groups at 12 months. Interestingly, and we'll see this pattern in other studies as well, they found that there was a higher rate of neovascular AMD in the patients who were receiving treatment. So sort of suggesting that maybe by sort of taking patients away from the sort of GA sort of progression, we're sort of turning on um, another switch, which I think is sort of an interesting pattern and something that we'll have to sort of encounter as retina specialists as treatments become on board. So based on the results of this phase two study, the phase three Derby and Oak studies were um, uh, 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 done. And so they also looked at sort of every month or every other month treatment and looking at the primary endpoint, which was change in uh, total area of GA lesions based on fundus autofluorescence. And looking at the sort of 12 months data in Oaks, um, uh, it was able to sort of meet uh, the primary endpoint of showing a change in GA lesion size, but unfortunately the Derby study did not meet that primary endpoint. Um, when they looked at sort of, um, uh, sort of a, a pre-specified analysis, they found that there was a reduction in lesion growth, especially in patients with foveal and extrafoveal lesions, with more of a change in those patients who had extrafoveal lesions. Um, and these results, along with the phase two Philly uh, study, have been uh, given to the FDA, and hopefully we'll have some information by the end of the year. And so they also um, sort of found in this study that there was an incident, a greater incidence of, of CNV in the treated eyes too. Um, so this data has come out, I think, in the past couple months, but um, they sort of continue to follow these patients, and at the month 18 time point in these two studies, um, those different curves actually di di diverged, and there was a significant difference in the change of growth area, looking at 18 months, where there wasn't necessarily in all these cohorts at 12 months. All right, so moving on to sort of the next thing to talk about. 
Zymura by Iverbio is a C5 inhibitor, um, and they've conducted one pivotal uh, study, which is the GATHER1 study. Um, and in that study, it met its pre-specified primary endpoint in reducing the GA size lesion. Um, and uh, in the two milligram cohort, it was by 27% and pretty much identical in the four milligram cohort. So there's the second phase three GATHER study that's underway. And as you can sort of see here, the incidence of, the, um, of, of having a CNV was higher in the treated eyes as composed to the sham. So here's sort of an illustration looking at the, um, at the mean rate of growth in the GATHER1 study, which showed that both in the two milligram and four milligram um, uh, doses, that there was a change in mean uh, rate of growth of GA area. And so the GATHER2 study looks pretty similar, where patients are getting sort of every month dosing at the two milligram for 12 months. And then at year two, those patients who were getting um, treated have then been split up to in into two different arms where the one arm is going to be getting, continue to get every month dosing and the other um, arm is going to be going to every other month. So I'm really interested to see what this shows as well. So moving on to a couple other things that are a little earlier um, in the pipeline. So Anexon has ANX007, which inhibits C1Q early in the classical pathway and purportedly allows the beneficial immune benefits of the other sort of complement pathways to still go on. And they've conducted a phase 1B study already that showed that there was um, uh, beneficial like suppression of C1Q, and the phase two Archer study is going on. Ionis has a novel specific antisense oligonucleotide that targets the complement factor B gene, and it's unlike sort of the other things that we've talked about, which have been given via, via an injection in the eye, it's actually given under the skin, and the phase one study results were promising. So the phase two Golden study is underway, um, sort of looking at similar sort of endpoints that the other studies do. So interested to see what this sort of non-injection will um, uh, look at. NGM also has NGM621, which is a humanized IgG1 monoclonal antibody that's designed to inhibit C3 and is given via an injection. Um, so the, it did well in the phase one study, was tolerated well, and so the phase two Catalina study is ongoing. All right, so we talked about complement a little bit. There's other sort of targets and sort of mechanism targets um, for GA, and one of these is antioxidative stress. So this thought behind this is that there's emergent evidence that there's an important role for mitochondrial dys dysfunction in AMD. So there's multiple risk factors that are associated with AMD, such as cigarette smoke, lipofusin, accumulation that can sort of trigger the mitochondrials to not work as they should normally. And then there's genetic disorders such as MIDD and MILOS, and those patients have been shown to have an increased rate of developing GA. So based on this, there's a couple companies that have sort of gone after this sort of pathway. So Stealth um, has a tetrapeptide that targets cardiolipin and mitochondria. And you can see in these beautiful sort of electron micrograph um, uh, of, the, uh, of a mouse model, you can see on sort of the left that there's sort of mitochondrial look as they normally are supposed to, but in sort of this is a diabetic model, they can get unhappy. But when the stealth um, agent has been um, instituted in those cells, the mitochondria look nice and happy again. So I think this is a sort of an interesting other a sort of approach to things. So the phase one like reclaim study um, looked at this and then uh, the uh, reclaim two study is sort of ongoing. Uh, Allegro has an anti-integrin small peptide molecule that downregulates er, oxidative stress. Um, so they have had a phase 2A study, which showed that patients with intermediate dry AMD um, did well with these injections. And in the treatment arm, actually 20% of them gained 15 or letters more. So there's a phase 2B clinical trial that's planned. So sort of the next target is anti-inflammatory agents. And some of these are things that I, I didn't necessarily think of as being sort of applied to geographic atrophy, but it's a sort of an interesting to sort of get at that mechanism. So one of the things that's being looked at is tetracyclines, which we all know is sort of an anti antibiotic that also has anti-inflammatory properties. So um, it's being investigated in the phase three TOGA study. Um, and then Genentech has FHTR2163. That's an antibody directed against the high temperature um, uh, requirement protein A1 that's delivered via, via an injection. And the phase two Galego study is looking at this. And then I think this is kind of a different sort of mechanism, but I think this has sort of attracted a lot of attention. Because if you sort of think about what GA treatment is going to look like, if you're thinking about injections, you're basically, patients in order to sort of have um, treatment effect are going to have to require treatment indefinitely to sort of slow growth. And that's going to be a huge burden for patients, especially if they're getting injections every month or every other month. So gene therapy, I think, is really exciting. Gyroscope has an AAV-based gene therapy that's designed to rebalance sort of the overactive complement um, system by expressing complement factor I. So they had the FOCUS-1-2 study, 
um, which showed promising results in terms of the um, uh, expression in vitreous, and then the Explore and Horizon studies are being looked at um, in, for as a phase two. So this is sort of an overview of sort of their studies. They have the Explore study that's looking at specific gene variants, and the Horizon study is more broad. And so uh, Peter was really nice to allow me to show one of his surgical videos from the Horizon GA study. You can see that this patient has geographic atrophy. You have to do a good vet. Make sure you sort of get the peripheral gel too. And then sort of testing expression or sort of like expression of the, um, of the therapeutic using 41 gauge cannula. And then sort of carefully using that 41 gauge cannula to be able to make blebs underneath the retina, which looks, he makes it look a lot easier than I'm sure it is in reality. Um, very delicate, uh, but is able to sort of create a small bleb there, find a different area where, of course, because it's Peter, there's no heme there, <laughs> um, and is able to create a nice other uh, bleb. And then we'll go back to, uh, to make those blebs larger and sort of together. And I think this is really exciting because Potentially, if this, if this works, it might mean much less burden for patients um, in terms of treatment. So um, I'm really happy that there's so many sort of modalities sort of um, being looked at. So, so in conclusion, GA is a progressive disease that unfortunately results in irreversible vision loss. And we really need sort of effective treatments to be able to reduce sort of the burden both to patients and, 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 and the community as a whole. So there's really a lot of ongoing settings that are really exciting, and I'm excited to sort of see what happens sort of in this next phase as, as, um, as more trials are done. Thank you so much. Excellent, and we'll take questions throughout at the beginning of the panel. Um, so we're gonna move on, uh, and uh, Alexandra Rachiskaya is gonna talk to us about pearls and PDS implantation and refills. Alexandra. Thank you so much, and thanks everybody for joining us this afternoon. Uh, so I'll be talking about PDS. Uh, these are my disclosures, and I conduct research as well as uh, Speakers Bureau and consulting with uh, Genentech. So as you know, uh, SASVIMO was approved in October of last year for patients with neovascular AMD who have previously responded to at least two anti-VEGF injections. So maybe by show of hands, so just I know who, who is in the audience, how many people have seen PDS implanted? All right, very good. Um, so this is what uh, the port delivery uh, looks like. And as I mentioned, it's approved for AMD and there's ongoing clinical trials in uh, diabetic macular edema. So you can see here, it's usually placed uh, supratemporally under the conjunctiva and tenons. And if you look at angle, you can actually see the port in the pars plana vitrectomy. However, if you look at the patient straight on, you don't see the, uh, the port and you also, the patient also doesn't see it. And I think it's important actually to know about uh, the uh, port delivery system because whether you're gonna be implanting those patients or doing refills or might be just seeing those patients in clinic, you know, um, and taking care of them and hopefully not their, their complications, uh, understanding what happens with these patients is, is very important. So these are, uh, these are the results of the Archway trial, uh, which is the trial that led to the um, approval of um, SASVIMO for uh, neovascular age-related macular degeneration. And basically in this trial, the patients already were started after they received uh, anti-VEGF injections. So when we look at the visual acuity, you don't see that nice increase that we usually see right after the patients uh, get anti-VEGF. Already from the get-go, they already had anti-VEGF on board and were responding to anti-VEGF. And basically at the primary endpoint, uh, it was shown that um, the treatment with uh, PDS was non inferior to the uh, monthly treatments with ranibizumab. Additionally, here you see the, um, the data from anatomic results from the OCTs, as well as the results of how many patients uh, needed, let me go back, how many patients needed uh, supplemental anti VEGF injections, and it was over 90% of patients did not require any supplemental injections in the uh, six months. So the, uh, the label for the, for the SASFEMA does have this uh, higher risk of endophthalmitis, the threefold higher risk of endophthalmitis. And it's interesting that a lot of these events were associated with conjunctival retraction or erosion. So we're gonna talk today about the surgical steps and I want you to keep in mind how the surgical steps are important in order to prevent uh, this uh, potential complication. 
So I'm going to show you videos because I think um, when we think about retina and retina surgery videos, it's just so much more fun. And um, and uh, but these are the the seven steps, and um, we'll go through each one of them, and I'll show you the video. So first is the pyridomy, and as retina specialists, we uh, don't really care about the conjunctiva, but I will tell you, I actually it made me a better surgeon. I think for some of my um, you know secondary IOLs, for instance. So you really want to make sure that you open the conjunctiva and tenons uh, together. This is very, very happy clicker. So you, open, uh, you want to open uh, conjunctiva and tenons together, and you want to bring it to the limbus. And you also have to think of where you're going to position your implant so it's not right next to where you're opening the conjunctiva radially. And uh, also we uh, advise to use the suture to um, move the cornea so you can uh, be in the right quadrant. So here you can see that traction suture is far away uh, from where the surgeon is working and you can see that when they open they get the uh, conjunctiva but actually they didn't get the tenons that are right under and uh, the incision is also not brought to the limbus. So this is something that's going to be at high risk of exposure uh, later and p potentially uh, infection. So scleral dissection is um, also is done in a very precise manner. Uh, this incision is 3.5 millimeters, and uh, it's a really situation where you measure twice and cut once because there has been reports of the implant um, going uh, into the eye uh, with refill, and you want to ensure that this incision is exactly uh, the right size. And um, Let's go further. So uh, initially when the uh, early trials were done, there was a uh, higher rates of vitreous hemorrhage. So pars plane ablation was introduced to minimize the rate of bleeding. And it's important, uh, you can see how nicely the surgeon here is not touching the wound and um, is, um, is staying away from the wound itself, not to make it larger. Um, and once again, before you actually proceed at this step, you're going to measure to make sure it's uh, still 3.5 millimeters. And there is the incision. Um, and uh, when you come out, you don't want to move from side to side uh, to enlarge uh, your sclerotomy. And finally, the uh, PDS plant implant insertion. Um, it's kind of snug, and uh, you have to apply a little bit of pressure, but it sits really nicely. So to go back to the conjunctiva, the closure is um, just as important as initiation of the surgery. So you, here you can see how uh, both the conjunctiva and tenons are brought to the limbus. And uh, we, uh, we actually learned a lot from our glaucoma co colleagues about closure because you really want to ensure that it's brought to the limbus and uh, the implant itself, the flange that's on the surface of the sclera, is uh, nowhere close to your radial incision. Here's an example where it didn't go as smoothly because you can see there's a gap uh, that is seen initially and this conjunctiva can retract as uh, time goes on and this patient's uh, implant can get exposed and result uh, in potential infection. So it's not, it's not a necessarily a difficult surgery, but it does require uh, precise attention to the steps. And uh, like I mentioned, you know, not everybody is necessarily going to be doing the surgery, and some people who are not doing the surgery might be doing refills. And the refills are done with the special needle. And the way the needle is designed, it has a, um, it's a vented needle. So as you're doing refill in the clinic, you can actually uh, get the old uh, drug out of um, the reservoir. And I'll show you examples of that. And so um, the... The way the implant sits in the eye, you have this target, and when you do the refill, you really want to be perpendicular to that target uh, because you risk not doing a complete refill. You risk damaging the implant, and there has been reports of uh, septum dislodgement uh, from potential um, um, non-perpendicular refill. So I'll show you some examples. So here's example one, and you can see how uh, they're trying to get into the implant and the needle is bending um, and it's, it's really hard to, um, you know, once, if you're not perpendicular, you're not going to be able to actually 
get in and, and get the refill. So it's very important to position yourself so um, you are comfortably positioned um, and your hand is stabilized and you're coming in perpendicular. Lighting is extremely important and usually it's advised to stand on the opposite side. So um, you can see uh, in this video as the injection happens, the uh, old drug uh, comes out in this needle. And then here is an example of some of a refill that goes more smoothly. And uh, you can see the perpendicular orientation. And uh, as it goes in, just watch uh, for that uh, end and you'll see the drug coming out as the new drug, as a fresh drug is being injected. And it's interesting because the patients uh, don't seem to tolerate this extremely well. I have patients who've had many, many injections who uh, get these refills, and it was very interesting. I had one patient who had to have injection in the other eye and then had to have a refill. And um, when he didn't have to have injection in the other eye, he told me, oh, today I'm not getting an injection. And I'm like, well, you're still getting a refill. To me, it's still an injection. He's like, no, 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 I'm not getting an injection today. I'm just getting a refill. It's so much easier. So it's, it's fascinating how uh, the perception of patients um, is, uh, is affected uh, by this experience. So I think in summary, the PDS surgery and refill procedures does require very specific steps. And understanding of the steps is important not only if you're involved in PDS implantation or PDS refills, but if you take care of any uh, neovascular AMD patients. Thanks so much. <laughs> All right, and I have an honor of introducing Dr. Peter Kaiser, who is speaking <coughs> next about bisimilars. Thanks, Alexandra. This is something that's coming, and so I thought I'd give you sort of an overview, first of all, of what it is, uh, what a biosimilar is, that is, and what are the drugs that we will possibly have biosimilar for in the future. Uh, here are my financial disclosures. Some are very relevant. Some are not so relevant. So what is a biosimilar? Well, the whole goal of a biosimilar is that we have a drug that's similar to something we have, and is cheaper, so that will give us lower drug prices, more options for patients, and maybe foster competition. And the FDA has defined this because biosimilars are different than generics. And, and I think it's really important to understand the difference between what a generic is and what a biosimilar is. So a generic is usually a small molecule. It is absolutely identical because it's chemically synthesized. And so the reference product and a generic are identical, and because of that, there are different rules. Biosimilars, because these are biologics, by definition are made in a cell line. So if you think about it, there's going to be minor differences batch to batch, cell to cell, and they are not absolutely identical. And that's even true for the reference product itself. I mean, that's why these companies spend so much money to make sure that from batch to batch, they're as similar as possible. And this really kind of shows that idea. Because they're made in a, in a cell line, they could be have slight differences in the glycosylation, they could have slight differences in the product, and that difference may actually lead to differences in the efficacy of the product. And so the FDA, when they do their evaluation of a biosimilar application, the majority of time is spent on that application looking at the CMC and how they actually are doing this and how they're purifying this so that it's within the acceptable range of what we'd want for a biosimilar biologic. And, and this is, uh, as you can see here, a very large process that is done within the FDA and they work very closely with the companies to really decide that the protein that the biosimilar is produ being produced is almost the same as the reference product. It's not equal. It never will be equal. So these are the two approval pathways. If you have a small molecule versus a biologic, that's why in the slide left there, you can see the generic uh, approval pathway is a very different pathway. You're trying to prove bioequivalence. And because of that, when you say go to the drugstore, uh, to the pharmacy, and you, you have a generic, the pharmacist has a right to basically interchange the generic for the reference product, right? They don't have to ask you 
as a physician. They don't have to ask the patient. They can just make that change, uh, and it's okay. In contrast with biologics, first of all, the approval process is different. As I said, you need to be highly similar, not identical. But if you want to get the interchangeability designation, so in other words, where, where a pharmacy or maybe even an insurance company can say you have to change it, um, there's additional testing that needs to be done. Um, if you look at the costs of doing all this, the original BLA for, for most drugs is about two and a half to three billion dollars. The approval path for a biosimilar is much less, you know, just north of 100 million, about 150 million dollars. So that's why these companies will allow you to have a break on the, on the price, we hope, because we haven't had any price, uh, pricing yet from any biosimilar company for any drug. Now, the EMA and the FDA actually have very, uh, they have similar but, but slightly different approval pathways. So because of that, when you look at the clinical studies that I'm going to show you in a moment, uh, the outcomes, the primary outcomes that were chosen are different, uh, and that's because the EMA requires different things than the FDA. But the, the, the similarities are that it, you only need to do one clinical study. So that's different, again, for a BLA for a regular drug where you need to do at least two. Um, and when you talk about the equivalencies, uh, the differences, there's differences in EMA and FDA, and I'll talk about that in a second. The other interesting thing about biosimilars is if you get approved in one indication, so you do a study in, say, macular degeneration, you get approved for all the indications the reference products had. So, for instance, with ranibizumab, that would include diabetic retinopathy, theoretically, DME, myopic CNV, Etc. So one approval, one study, you get approved for everything. You don't have to do like we do with a normal drug. You have to do each subsequent study, and it take, takes a while. Uh, the other interesting thing is how they're named. And, and CME police are just going to have an absolute field day with this because the U.S. FDA has said the, on, the only difference, the way you name them differently, the way you tell them apart, is by a four-letter random suffix, devoid of meaning, right? So just some random four-letter thing that they put behind ranibizumab. So if I'm up here, let's just say for the sake of argument, one of the biosimilar companies has a problem with their drug, right? So for me to say, you know, ranibizumab XYZA and then versus ranibizumab BCDE, you're like, what the hell are you talking about, right? I mean, there'd be no way to tell it apart, but that's what the FDA is making us do. EMA doesn't require any name change. They're all called ranibizumab, for instance. That makes it even more complicated. Um, I hope the CME will allow, police will allow us to actually use the brand name because that was the only way for us to actually tell these biosimilars apart in a CME meeting. So I'm going to talk about three uh, biosimilars that have positive phase three studies. The first is SB11, and don't even ask me what the four-letter thing is behind it because this is actually FDA approved. So I'm just going to call it SB11. That way you actually can tell these apart. But look in the bottom. It's a one-year study, but the primary outcome in the EMA is central subfield thickness at one month. That's not the company trying to pull a fast one and say, we want our primary to be at a month. That's the EMA saying that to them. And, it, and that is actually the hardest time. There's the most noise around your OCT one month in, and that's why this is actually a very hard primary outcome. The US FDA will allow you to use that if you want, but they give you an easier one, which is it, at two months, you need to have non-inferiority non of vision. Um, and again, that's the FDA. The study, if, so if I'm designing a study, Dan, if you design a study, wouldn't you want to do the primary outcome at week 48? It's going to be much easier to hit because then the noise disappears over time. So these are harder outcomes. So in this study, they met the non-inferiority margin on central subfield thickness at one month. They also met the primary outcome at week eight for the US FDA in terms of non-inferiority of vision. Over time, they also met the fact that there was essentially no difference between the visual acuities. Now, we wouldn't expect this. This is ranibizumab. The, the thing that really you'd want to look at for any biosimilar clinical study is safety. And so if you look at the safety, the safety was also good. And if you've been following the biosimilar pathways for a while, in India, for instance, 
they already have biosimilars with ranibizumab approved. And one of the earliest ones that was approved had a lot of issues with inflammation. Uh, a considerable inflammation, and they've worked on it, and now it's back down to acceptable levels. But when you look at a biosimilar, you want to look at the incidence of ADAs, neutralizing antibodies, and inflammation. In this case, there really wasn't much difference between the reference ranibizumab, so Genentech Roche, uh, ranibizumab, and SB11. Uh, a second phase three clinical study from another company looked at FYB201 versus reference ranibizumab, pretty much an identical study design, identical primary outcomes in terms of week eight and week four for the, week, uh, for the EMA. Uh, as you'd expect, again, primary outpoint was met, visual acuity between these drugs was the same, central subfield thickness was the same. These are the slides you actually want to care about, which is the safety, and thankfully the safety between the two drugs was similar. Uh, looking at IOI there, they were both 8% uh, with no retinal occlusive vasculitis. And then finally, the EXPLORE study, same thing, same outcome. I don't have the pictures from it, but suffice it to say they were equal. So right now in the U.S., we have one approved ranibizumab biosimilar from Samsung Biogen. The drug will start to be sold sometime in June, July timeframe due to an agreement with Genentech Roche not to sell it earlier. So even though it's approved, it's not currently for sale. Uh, the Formicon Coherus biosimilar is, uh, has a positive phase three. It's not yet FDA approved. And then the last one that I showed you was from Bausch and Loam and Zybram, which again is also not yet FDA approved. There's a special case for bevacizumab because there already have been approved bevacizumab biosimilars in oncology. And to date, there have not, no insurance company has required us to use a biosimilar bevacizumab compounded, although some have tried. Uh, and the ASRS and the AAO and others have fought very hard to make sure that we're not required or nor should we have to step through a biosimilar bevacizumab. However, there is a company called Outlook Therapeutics is doing something different. They're taking the bevacizumab biosimilar and they're actually going for FDA approval of a uh, single use, uh, so it's not compounded, uh, much higher purified version of bevacizumab. So it's still a biosimilar, but unlike what we use from a, from a compounding agency, this is actually uh, will be FDA approved in a different route. So it's not the same biosimilar route. So we'll see what happens with that because they did have a positive uh, phase three. And finally, Flibercept biosimilars are currently in clinical studies, although the patent doesn't run out on this in the U.S. till 2023. And if the Regeneron uh, Bayer people can get an additional indication, then that would actually go out to 2024. So that's where we stand with biosimilars, and um, I'm sure we're going to have a very robust discussion on this during the panel. Thank you. Wonderful. So next up we have uh, Mark Verica talking about different methods of gene therapy delivery. All right, thank you so much for having me. As we talk a little bit about different delivery methods for gene therapy, uh, I'm already a minute 47 seconds behind. Um, here, <laughs> here are my disclosures, notably at Verum and uh, Regenex Bio. So there's three main um, delivery methods that we think about, intravitreal, supracoroidal, subretinal. I will not bore you with intravitreal. I think we've all done those ad nauseum. So we're gonna talk a little bit about supracoroidal. And supracoroidal, as you can see here, it's, it's, it's a little bit different, right? So the approach has to be perpendicular to the scleral surface. You wanna get a nice indentation of, of the conjunctiva, the sclera, by applying the right hub pressure. And you wanna wait until you apply the plunger pressure until you're nice and firm against the globe. And then once you get in the, in the correct potential space, the supracoroidal space, there will be a release and you see the medication going in. And uh, you uh, maintain some pressure just to uh, make sure that there's no reflux of the medication. And so this is, of course, 
uh, has an FDA approval recently for trimcinolone and, and CME for uveitis, but also being looked at for gene therapy. And so here are the do's. This is one of my cases um, of the supracoital injection. This is an infrared camera. So you see the yellowish areas are warm, the purplish areas are cool, and of course the uh, investigational product is gonna be cooler. And you'll see I'm applying hub pressure there, and you start seeing that there's a, a nice diffuse dispersion as the medication goes into the supracoital space, as the temperature drops in that area. I'm still holding some pressure on there. And sooner or later, if you give it enough time, the pressure gradient disappears. I'm still maintaining pressure just to uh, basically keep the medication from coming back out. This is actually the, uh, the first supercoil injection of gene therapy, and uh, we were lucky to do that in the Phoenix area. All right, pet peeve of mine. Everyone shows you the greatest case. So these are the don'ts. This is where I messed up. Um, this is actually my first case where I, instead of doing a subconjunctival lidocaine injection, this is where I did a topical injection, uh, um, just topical anesthesia. So frankly, I was a little worried about the pressure I was putting on. So remember I told you don't, don't hit the plunger before you do the pressure? I did just that, look at that. Suddenly you have gene therapy right washing over the eye, not going where it needs to go. Of course, patient needs to be rinsed off and applied, but later on, Toward the end, you can see I'm actually applying the correct amount of pressure, and it's a little bit of spread. Not sufficient, of course, we have to make up for that, but still, um, you, you, every step along the way is important. Patient did fine, I was the one that was nervous. It's, a it's just a little bit of pressure. Let's, let's be honest, the, the needle is frankly 900 microns. So that's supercoroidal. Let's talk a little bit about subretinal. We already touched on that before. Um, you know, sitting here amongst some of my, my former attendings, um, you can always hear them yelling in your ear saying, hey, every step is important. The first step is the most important step. Same thing holds true with subretinal uh, uh, administration. It's, it's VIT 101, right? You gotta elevate the highlight. And it sounds silly, but you know, consider staining with trimcinolone, uh, possible peeling techniques. Of course, visualization is gonna be key. And then you wanna do consistent flow. For most of these trials, we actually, most all, you have an injector that's uh, the connected to the vitrectomy machine. Manual, you're not gonna get the same sort of drip rate, the same flow rate, and you wanna have as, as few variables as possible. And then, of course, blood formation. So one of the things you might consider is managing the intraocular pressure. Uh, it might be a little bit difficult sometimes if you're injecting a lot of volume, if you're fighting the pressure, you may wanna make sure that th uh, during the vitrectomy, the vitreous around the infusion cannula is clear so there's no flap blocking it, and so that can self-regulate. You want to identify the correct surgical plane. So there's two groups here, two camps. Either you start the injection first, just as you're about to touch down, and then you touch down, or you touch down first, see a little bit of blanching, back off, and then you start infusing. So those are the kind of the visual cues. And then once you have it, you want to uh, avoid reflux as much as possible. Reflux can and will happen on occasion, and if so, you may want to consider a second bleb and keep it separate from the, from the prior bleb. If it's too close, they're gonna start communicating, and then you have the same problem all over again. So this is actually one of my cases um, that kind of helps illustrate all of these things. Um, in, in fairness, uh, I've, I've done a handful, a, a fair number of these at this point. They, they usually go smooth as butter. Um, this is a patient with AMD. So why, why even bother staining with triamcinol? Most of the time, the highlight's up already, right? It's a waste of, waste of our time. Uh, not so much in this case, of course, because the high load is super sticky, does not want to come up, it's trying to make my life miserable. If you try to do a, create a bleb with the high load down, you're going to have a hard time getting in the correct plane, and you always worry about PVR later on as well. So, of course, I use stain. And at this point, trying to get a nice, uh, nice elevation of the high load, I'm going to, the plan is to go inferiorly because that's just uh, the indication for, for this trial. High loads up, clean it up. Uh, again, VIT 101. And then look around, make sure there's no breaks as I'm trying to decide where exactly to put this. Uh, in fairness, I didn't get the entire high load up. Uh, superiorly, it was probably still a, a adherent, but I it was 100% uh, sure that I was off in that one quadrant where I needed it to be off. No tears. Here's the fun part, right? This is the part, the first part everyone always skips. This is the part that people look at. So I like to create a stream first before I touch down. 
As you see, bleb, easy peasy, wait a minute, it's coming out a little bit, right? So there's some, some of the uh, gene therapies coming out. So what I'm trying to do now, okay, maybe I can adjust the angle, maybe I can pull back a bit, you know, a lot of wishful thinking. Don't, don't be a wishful thinker like me, right? So even though the bleb is growing, at some point enough is enough, back off, reassess, go in a different quadrant. And, and, and try again, again, start the bleb formation here, and it goes nice and smooth. In fairness, the second bleb, that's your usual bleb. This is all within our skill set. This is not uh, uh, difficult if you're, if you're meticulous, but um, there you have it. It is a little mo bit more difficult, depending on the indication where you do it. If you go more posterior, it's a little easier, frankly. But for this trial, we were trying to go uh, further out. Get a nice volume there. And towards the end, you'll see two blebs that are pretty close to each other, frankly, but not communicating, which is good, because I don't want, there you go, those two blebs, because I don't want the, the IP, the investigation product, to come out. So, you know, those are basically the, the three main uh, ways of approaching gene therapy delivery. There's multiple di different ways. The intravitreal, again, we all do that every day. Supercoil approach, really it's managing the uh, perpendicularity, not being afraid to put some pressure on the eye um, and wait for that release from the plunger. With subretinal approach, you just have to be meticulous the way you normally are. Um, you, you have to make sure the highlight's up, you have to be sure about where you want to place the bleb, and you have to manage the, the, the flow and the pressure. And so these are all very doable. And you know, frankly, I look forward to all of us as a community exploring these different uh, uh, approaches for gene therapy as, as there's a ho hopefully a very bright future ahead with gene therapy for many different indications, as mentioned before. And with that, I thank you. All right, and next up we have uh, Dr. Martin talking about DACR studies, and it's not just about diabetes. Thank you, Alexandra. <coughs> I have no financial interest to disclose. So the DRCR retina, so this talk is about the DRCR retina network. Um, <coughs> and it's, I'm gonna give you a little bit of an overview of sort of how it came to be, and then give you a little bit of an overview of the trials that we've done, uh, and then talk about the trials that we didn't do. Um, you'll see why in just a minute. So the network was founded in 2002. Um, was founded as the Diabetic Retinopathy Clinical Research Network. Uh, there was a small group of us that founded that. I was one of those. Uh, for me, CAT came along in 2005 and sort of took over my life, and I had to step away from the network. And during that time, we were trying to convince the NIH to develop an AMD network, and we actually went in with several grants to do that, and the, the NIH basically said no. We finally convinced them in 2016 to merge the concept of having a macular degeneration network with the DRCR network, and the, uh, the agency allowed us to expand the scope to study all retinal diseases. And so with that, we renamed ourselves the DRCR Retina Network. DRCR now stands for nothing. It's like KFC and Kentucky Fried Chicken, right? It's just KFC. <coughs> I mean, the KFC doesn't officially stand for Kentucky Fried Chicken anymore. <coughs> uh, Anyway, so we are, we, are the, we are the DRCR retina network. We cover all retinal diseases. <laughs> what was that? <laughs> well, this, I've been trying to explain. People ask me, why did you keep the DRCR? And believe me, you wouldn't believe it. It took us a, an, a year to decide on this because personally, I wanted it to be just the drop the D and just called it the Retina Clinical Research Network. But the DRCR, those four letters are branded pretty well. And I understood why some people didn't want to let go of it. So we just retained the letters as the brand. It's kind of an intermediary. I suspect at one point we're probably going to drop DRCR. Um, over the last 20 years, we've performed 36 multi-centered trials. We have more than 100 publications, 160 clinical sites. Uh, this is our structure. I have the privilege of serving as one of the two network chairs along with Jenny Sun at the Joslin. Um, when this was sort of uh, conceptualized, uh, we had an expanded network. We realized it was way too big of a job for one person. Technically, Jenny was to become the diabetes person. I was to be the everything else person. Um, the reality is Jenny and I work so well together, we both kind of do all of it. There's 1,800 members our in our network, and shameless plug, if any of you are interested in being involved in clinical research, please, please, please consider getting involved in the network. We've completed more than 30 clinical trials to date, and these are, many of them are, are trials that you recognize, protocol I, protocol T, protocol S, uh, protocol V. But 
every one of those trials at some point started as a protocol idea. We solicited solic solic these from the from our investigators, from 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 pharma, from anyone really. Uh, <clears throat> And what happens to this idea is that it goes to our operations group, it goes then to the investigator group, uh, it then goes, if it passes through those three phases, it goes to the protocol development committee, uh, then approval by the executive committee, um, then technically goes back to the protocol development committee, then back to the executive committee, then it goes to our data safety monitoring committee, then it goes out for an NIH external protocol review committee, and it, it finally emerges as a final DRC or network protocol. It's an incredibly uh, exacting a process, but it all starts with an idea. Since 2009, we've evaluated 248 protocol ideas. Many are common clinical questions that we encounter in our day-to-day -day retina practice. Each is carefully reviewed, some are extensively developed. Very few, if uh, ever make it to a full trial, only about one in 20. This is a huge part of what I do. The two network chairs, we wind up writing up a lot of these things, we wind up sort of try fully vetting them, trying to explore it. Is this something that we should do a clinical trial on? It represents a huge body of academic work that no one ever sees um, until today. Uh, <clears throat> what I decided to do, I, I, it's, it's really interesting to look back at the trials that you didn't do and, and ask why. Because a lot of people in your in your day-to-day -day practice you'll think, oh, I want to know the answer to that, and you'll submit an idea, and yet it'll never make it to a trial. So I, I want to show you kind of how the network thinks and how, we, how one might go about designing a clinical trial. What I did was I picked out five protocol ideas that we have vetted recently with regards to AMD. So a couple of these I presented, some of them I've never presented before. Um, so the first one is, should anti-VEGF injections be given to prevent exudative macular neovascularization in eyes with high-risk non-exudative AMD? Sort of the concept of a protocol W or panorama or diabetic retinopathy that start to inject before people develop a, a serious consequence that threatens their vision. The concept of doing this is very appealing. And, and a lot of people, including me, wanted to do this study. <clears throat> and we've spent a long time developing this trial, more than a year. We imagined it as a thousand eyes. Uh, you're gonna have exudative C and V in the, or M and V in the left eye, or in one eye, and the fellow eye was gonna be eyes with high risk drusen. You'd be randomly assigned to anti-VEGF Q3 months versus Q6 months versus a sham injection. The primary outcome was development of macular neovascularization of the study eye as confirmed by fluorescein and OCT. <clears throat> as we sort of work through this, we begin to ask ourselves, what exactly are we preventing? And Because if you talk to patients about this, they'll say, yeah, I'd really like to prevent that from happening in the other eye. So we began to ask ourselves, well, really, how bad is it? How often does the second eye develop disease? And what, and, and what happens to those eyes? And we started combing the literature. There's actually very little written. And much to my surprise, we've written 65 papers in, from CAT. Um, we had actually not looked at this question. I don't know how we missed this, but we, we had not. So in the course, the two-year course of the study, um, there were 1,185 uh, patients, study eyes, and 134 fellow eyes converted over the course of the study. And look, their start, when they converted, their visual acuity was better. The second eye, when it developed CNV, develops, has, presents with better vision, and it makes sense because the right eye is compromised in many cases. Any little change to the best eye is oftentimes detected early. Plus, they're also coming into your office regularly. You're, they're being seen, so you're gonna catch them earlier. So they tend to be caught earlier. And when we looked at the one-year follow-up, they tended to see better, see pretty good. So then we began to ask ourselves, well, wait a minute, do we really need to prevent this? Because it turns out 85% of eyes, second eyes, are 2040 or better at one year. So Maureen McGuire and Wes Below at the DRCR put together this predictive model. And I won't go into the details of it, but when you run it using the CAT data, and we actually used it, used another data set as well, but just for this was for using the CAT data. It turns out with no preventative treatment, the model predicted that 95% of eyes would wind up 20, 40 or better. And if you had a drug that prevented 25, 50 or 75%, you only increased that by about one percentage point. And the cost of doing that was astronomical, 1.2 million per eye. So at the end of the day, 
the model predicted that the therapeutic effect was so relatively small and the cost of doing so was so high, the number needed to treat was going to be a real problem, and we didn't do the trial. At the same time, the PROCON study that Jeff Heyer was running and the PREVENT study, so the PROCON was, was, was with uh, Flibercept and PREVENT study was done with, with ranibizumab, and thank you to Regeneron and to Genentech for sponsoring those two studies because they wound up being critical in helping us figure out that this is probably something that we didn't need to do. Number two, should ARED supplements be continued when the second eye develops neovascular AMD? So this happens all, all the time. Patient develops a second eye, and about four months, six months later, the patient asks you, hey, doc, should I keep taking these ARED supplements? Because we forget to have a conversation about it. And then when they ask you, how do you respond? I don't know. No one knows. <clears throat> and so to answer that question, which comes up all the time, you have to go back to what were the primary effects of the ARED supplements? What were they intended to do? They were to reduce the risk of progression to neovascular AMD, and vision loss, and those are the two things we reported in in uh, in uh, uh, study in, in uh, publication number eight in 2001. So the problem here is that in these eyes, both areas outcomes have already occurred. So what would the primary outcome be? We considered mean change in visual acuity, but the effect in areds was not large, and would almost certainly be dwarfed or masked by the larger anti-vegf effect that was about to start in these eyes. So. There's probably not much, it'd be really hard to detect this and to have a huge trial to detect one if a benefit existed. We looked at an anatomical outcome growth of coronary vascularization. That's challenging due to the variable growth rates and also the low R square, the low correlation of, of the, the, sorry, the low coefficient of determination with visual acuity. All right, number three, what's the optimal management of large subretinal hemorrhage in eyes with AMD? <coughs> So the problem with this one, this was submitted by a lot of people. A lot of people wanted us to do this trial. They wanted to do a randomized clinical trial of, of anti-VEGF versus surgery. So the problem is, is that the frequency is low. Is it worth spending 10 to $15 million to answer something that's fairly uncommon or more? Um, the second is that enrollment would be a challenge. The other problem is you have a wide variability in presentation. Sometimes you get a little hemorrhage, sometimes you get a lot. So somehow you gotta define that. Somehow you have to define that. That's a problem. We actually took a crack at this. It's what you really want to measure is the thickness of the hemorrhage, and there's no really good OCT is really not that good at that. Can't do it by 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 ultrasound. There's not a, a good reliable way. You really have to, to to describe the whole area that's involved. It's really more challenging than you'd think. And then you have the problem of we already know that some of these eyes do well with anti-VEGF injections alone. We learned that from CAT. Um, here are some eyes are treated with subretinal hemorrhage baseline, went up 2020. Uh, this is a patient of justices, uh, went up 2040 just after four intravitreal injections. So the question is how big of a hemorrhage should we even consider for this? A lot of people having this experience are not going to put these patients in the study, and so you have a real problem with investigator equipoise. And then you have the cost issue that I spoke about. Number four. Could statins be effective for drusen regression and prevention of advanced AMD? So you all may remember a few years ago, Dimitri Va um, Vavis um, published a paper that showed in 10 to 23 eyes that were treated with high-dose atorvastin, 80 milligrams a day, that they had drusen regression. And it was really impressive. I remember when that came out, I thought, wow, that's really cool. So, okay, so th there were lots of protocol ideas and lots of discussion about this. <coughs> The first thing that was submitted was simply to look at the question of, do statins have any role in AMD? So you review the literature. There are some that say yes, but most of them say no. And by far and away, the best paper comes from a, a probably a little appreciated study these days called the CAPT study. Um, this was a laser to Drusen study, 1,052 eyes that Maureen McGuire ran and Stuart Fine. And basically, in that study, there was zero effect of statins on eyes that had bilateral large drusen. It did not reduce the progression. Okay, so standard doses don't work, which is 20 to 40 milligrams. How about higher doses? The pilot study is pretty provocative, but the problem is drusen are more dynamic than most people realize. They can come and go. Once again, to go back to the CAPT study, this is drusen regression. The blue bars are with laser, but look at the yellow bars. Look at five years, a third of eyes have spontaneous drusen regression, and it's significant. 
Here's uh, an eye with a 50% drusen reduction at just simply one year. Here's another one. And of course, we selected out the best ones. But I can actually show you quite a few of these. Drusen are dynamic. They come and go. As my, <coughs> my mentor, uh, Rick Ferris, told me, results are always improved by admitting the control group. So, so, okay, so you have to have a control group to do this right. So what's the control group? What's the design? You did a randomized clinical trial of high-dose statins versus placebo. Makes sense. Except that a high percentage of the eligible patients, these are all 70 and 80-year-olds, they're already taking statins. And more probably, when you screen them, you're going to find that probably more should be. We estimated it's probably 70 or 80 percent. So now I've got to take people off statins for the control group, which I can't do, or either I've got to enroll a cohort of people that don't represent the general population at risk. So that doesn't work. So then we looked at, <clears throat> okay, maybe we can compare low dose versus high dose, or standard dose versus high dose. So the problem there is, I just told you the standard dose has no effects. It's reasonable to assume the high dose is not going to be much. So you have to have a huge trial to show the difference. And the real problem is when you begin to look at the literature on the tolerance of 80 milligrams of atorvastin, people can't take this stuff for years. More than 50% discontinue. So that's a no-go. The fifth one is, should I treat, uh, treat, should I use treat and extend or PRN as my anti-VEGF treatment algorithm? This was an older issue. This has kind of already been answered by the community, but I, I kept this one because everybody uses treat and extend. Most, very few people use PRN as the primary mechanism now. But I, I put this in here just to hopefully inform some of the conversation because some of the things that are said about treat and extend and have been said about extre treat and extend are just wrong. They're just, and they're just poorly informed statements. And I don't want you to be poorly informed, <laughs> okay? So all three of the randomized clinical trials that directly compared monthly versus PRN, there were only three, CAT, Ivan, and Harbor. And all three showed exactly a two-letter difference at one and two years in favor of monthly treatment. Is there any reason treat and extend would be better than monthly? No. Is there any reason to think that t &E would be worse than PRN? No. So your results got to fit in those two letters. Your hypothesis, though, is that it's superior. How's that going to fit? It's got to fit between zero and two letters, which is noise. I can show you study after study after study. Anything less than a two-letter difference in almost every randomized clinical trial that's ever been performed is noise. The, just the random chance that there would be a difference is high. So really what you'd have is you'd have to have, it's got to fit there. And who cares? <laughs> if, it's one, if, I, if I could do a 100,000 patient clinical trial, who cares about a one letter difference? So in summary, the reasons we haven't conducted randomized clinical trials for the, th these are just five examples. And the first example I gave you the estimates of clinical benefit are low. The number needed to treat would be unacceptable and the cost excessively high. In the one, the, the do I continue ARED supplements in people when the second eye develops, uh, develops uh, neovascular AMD, the challenge is defining the, out, the primary outcome. In the subretinal hemorrhage example, the disease prevalence is low with variable presentation. The challenge is related to, which leads to challenges in enrollment, defining the intercriteria and achieving investigator equipoise. And the fourth example, the statin example, the current standard of care makes enrolling a representative population essentially impossible. And the last one, the treatment extend versus peer and the chance of a difference is so small, who cares? So the question's effectively, and the question's already effectively been answered. And throughout all this, we're constantly balancing the public visual health impact against the cost of the study. The DRC is not a rich organization. Uh, the federal government gives us some money, but never gives us nearly enough. Um, and uh, with that, I will stop. Thank you. Do you want to do questions? No, we'll do them, we'll do them at the panel. Okay. Yep. All right. And next up, we have uh, Dr. Rishi Singh talking about diabetic retinopathy and DME. And uh, as G Rishi gets ready, I just want to make an announcement about the... Uh, social media posting, don't be shy. And uh, uh, you can mention call iRetina Summit or uh, tag at iVista Medical Education, and then you can win uh, Bose wireless headphones. If you don't know how to use social media, uh, Sunil is your pro. <laughs>
just take picture of Sunil. It's, it's actually Rishi, but yeah, that, that <laughs> I don't too. think any of you should apply. I'm going to win this anyway. Yeah, I know you, you got it already. <laughs> it's already on Rishi.com. That's all right. Yeah, yeah. Just, just, take, just take a picture of Rishi and put one of Malaya Ratna Summit, and you'll have headphones. You can take one of Sunil. He's not on social media. Maybe in 15 to 20 years. My son is. My son's posting right now. <laughs> he's already, he's going to win this contest, by the way. I'm letting you know. <laughs> All right, so for the next 35 minutes, I'll be discussing <laughs> diabetic retinopathy and DME. You know, I'm surprised we can get these talks done in 10 minutes, so I'm very impressed that Dan stuck to less than seven minutes, I believe, in his talk, yes, so I'm exactly. very impressed. But I'll try to keep my coverage in 10 minutes and get through this. Here are my financial disclosures for the presentation. So these are the take-home points of my discussion day. Medical management is still the foundation of DR, DME and DR treatment. Vision is really a guidance point right now. We use a lot of this rather than anatomy to figure out how to take care of patients. We use imaging as a guide to treatment response. Certainly, there have been a lot greater biomarkers now in our literature and through our research. Anti-VEGF is first-line therapy for center-involving DME. Focal laser and steroids are adjunctive or even second-line treatments for these conditions. And for DR, the verdict is out whether laser or anti-VEGF or a blended approach should be applied first. So medical management obviously has been well established. Multiple different studies, including these here, that have been very helpful at determining how much medical management can manage and uh, really keep these patients under control. And I think this is a missed opportunity in, in clinics. I think you have the choice of spending time with the patients. Checking a blood pressure takes all of five minutes, and you'll find patients in hypertensive urgency and emergency. And that's a really important point, because these can lead to end-stage issues and obviously end-stage uh, retinopathy complications. And again, this is what we've learned that aggressive glucose control, aggressive weight loss, lipid lowering, blood pressure control, and antithrombosis therapy can be really helpful to reducing these microvascular issues and progression of DME over time. Let's sort of review some of these, which I think are important. This is a DCCT, again, showing you higher levels of hemoglobin A1C matter. So controlling patients as best as possible, even you encouraging them to seek out endocrinology, get on insulin therapy, these can be very helpful to their overall state. And we are aware that intensive therapy does uh, actually result in worsening of retinopathy for the first two years. And this is not actually a, a phenomenon of DCT. It was actually looked at in multiple studies. This is a meta-analysis, uh, which was published two or three years ago. And multiple studies have validated these findings that early um, worsening does occur with strict medical management in these conditions. And Bella Optianan, one of our researchers at Coli, actually found that insulin actually stimulates VEGF production through IGF. And so that might be the reason why this happens and unfortunately causes damage to the patients very early in the study. Um, phenofibrate is a drug that's been available for a while. We don't use it much in the U.S., but it's used abroad. And that just shows you again to the comment Dr. Martin made about statin therapy that definitely these can have some improved outcomes. Lipid lowering therapy in this uh, study reduced retinopathy, PDR rates, and definitely macular edema. And again, validates the, the value of lipid lowering therapies. The ACCORD trial that actually was done at Cleveland, uh, Dr. Kaiser actually was the PI for the Coal Line Institute at the time when this was around, showed that it basically if you looked at the outcomes, glycemic therapy and dyslipidemia resulted in significant benefits in the patients who were intensively controlled. Blood pressure, interestingly, did not in the study. I think that's a little bit of a misnomer. This was only systolic controlled blood pressure. It wasn't mean arterial blood pressure, so that's why you saw that change there. And again, renal angiotensin um, agonists or inhibitors really have also been shown to reduce the progression of retinopathy and the incidence of first time to DME and DR. And that's something I think we all forget about as well. And this is your chance, again, to educate our primary care and endocrinology colleagues on these sort of events. So when do we treat DME? We have thresholds divided by vision, 2020 to 2025, center involving DME with protocol V that helped us define those patients. 2032 to 2400, this was mainly protocol T that we have now that defines how we treat these patients. And then prophylaxis for DME uh, looked at by protocol S and protocol W in those studies. So this is an example of patient, 2025 visual acuity, uh, retinal thickness is 338. The question becomes, do you observe, do you laser this patient, or do you give them anti-VEGF therapy? They have moderate uh, center involving DME, as you can see by the foveal scans. And the answer is that we have protocol V, which helped us by looking at patients who are randomized to either prompt anti-VEGF, prompt laser, and deferred anti-VEGF, or observation in these patients. And they looked at a primary outcome of the uh, changed and, and uh, retinal thickness over a two-year period. And what they found essentially is with the similar rates of five-letter vision loss over that two-year period, there were anatomically similar outcomes in these cases. So therefore, the conclusion from this trial was you could pretty much observe patients with good vision without serious consequence. And uh, this is unfortunately the limitation of this study. This is a limited timeline for only two years. 
Healthy patients, the hemoglobin A1C was 7.6. I don't think we see many of those that are practiced right now. And motivated patients with good follow-up obviously makes this study much easier to follow. But the real um, world clinical application of this, I think, is the most important. This is Glenn Yu's study he did at UC Davis with almost 104 patients. This is retrospective single center. But what it showed essentially is that you had patients with very similar uh, inclusion criteria to the studies, albeit their hemoglobin A1Cs were very different. And what he found in the study was really quite interesting. A year's time, they had many patients progress to significant visual loss, almost 20, 50 by the end of this trial, with get undergoing laser and injections almost within the first year in many of the patients seen here. So again, the retinal thicknesses are increased, and certainly the visual acuity is not as good. And so that might lend its clearance to the idea that maybe we need to follow these patients a little bit different in practice and might happen. They looked at all the baseline outcomes to see what baselines might have predicted that, and the answer was none of them really were significant other than cataracts in these patients. So we really don't have a good biomarker to say your patient perfect for pleural V or your patient for a real-world scenario who may get worse over time and therefore needs different therapy. So real-world protocol V does not equivalent clinical trial protocol V. Again, the real-world setting is very different with suboptimal visual outcomes and, again, hemoglobin A1Cs, which are far less controlled. And so, again, you have to really consider a case-by-case -case basis for many of these patients. For, for VA of 2032, 2040, 2400, we have excellent results from protocol T that helps to determine if your visual is 2032 to 2040, you'll have equivalent outcomes with all of these three drugs. But for 2050 or worse, clearly a flibercept was superior to the other two drugs with regards to this. But I think this is only skin deep in what the results really showed. I think you have to go deeper to those good VA patients and figure out what the answer was. And what you could see essentially is that if you look at those patients with 400 microns of retinal thickness or greater in the good vision acuity category, they actually resulted in a far different outcome than those patients for, 20, for less than 400 microns. Let me show you what that looks like essentially on a graph. So on the left side, you have 2032 to 2040 with thicker retinas greater than 400 microns. You can see that both the branded drugs outdid Avastin in this case. And you can see on the right side with uh, thinner retinas of 400 microns or less, they're equivalent in nature. So again, it's not so easy to say patients 2040 are better definitely use uh, any of these three drugs. I think you have to look at the retinal thickness. And this was a pre-specified endpoint in the study. This was not a secondary analysis. So I think it's missed a lot when you talk about the study. I think it's important things to bring to clinical practice. We have great imaging biomarkers to tell us about DME treatment, like central subfield thickness fluctuation, interretinal cyst size, hyperreflective foci, and drill, disorganization of the retinal inner layers. And what you can see from this one in particular, drill, is that the horizontal extent of this correlates with baseline visual acuity. And in fact, if you see this within four months, continued four months of this association of the layers, that is a really poor biomarker for a, a, a final visual outcome in these patients. So I think that those are good things to look at as you're treating the patients for the first three or four months to really get a sense of their drill if it's responding to the therapy. Otherwise, you have to consider what the options might be. There's not good answers right now by literature's sake or from studies, but at least we know that this is an opportunity for us to look in patients and talk about the real visual prognosis in these patients when drill is present. Hyperreflective foci are super interesting because these are subclinical lipoproteins that are supposed to be inflammatory biomarkers of the breakdown of the blood retinal barrier. And we know from some studies that actually uh, steroids do better at, in at decreasing these hyperreflective foci than uh, anti-VEGF therapy. So that's another thing you may consider when you start treating these patients over time. And intranal cyst size, the value of this really is about uh, a cyst that's greater than 200 microns in size. And the cyst is actually correlated with the extent of macular ischemia. So you may use this as a biomarker to follow in these patients over time. Now, I think retinal thickness is something we all look at in clinical practice and say, oh, well, your retinal thickness is great today, and last time it was great, but really is that a good biomarker to follow? And the answer is, is that you can see this patient who had great retinal thickness by the end of the study, but they had severe fluctuations in their retinal thickness through the time period. So we actually, um, so this is protocol T and V. They both looked at this subfield analysis, the thickness variability, and found direct correlations to the highest level of fluctuation and negative visual prognosis in these patients by about one to three letters. Again, trials are great. They help us establish 
uh, randomized studies that have a lot of validity. But when we look at this in the real world, it can be really quite different. That seems like an inconsequential difference of three letters in that. Well, we actually did this study using the um, NOAA algorithm from Natal Vision, Natal Company, and actually did this on our patients at Cleveland Clinic. And we found almost a 10-letter differential in the highest quartile of retinal thickness. And what that number was, was about 65 microns. So just think about that when you go back to clinic on Monday. 65 microns of fluctuation can be a significant negative biomarker for these patients and may need or may require more intensive therapy or potentially another drug in that realm to actually dry the retina better. The, I think the good question you have to ask yourself is, does, do any of these outcomes of anti-VEGF therapy cause differences in DME or DR outcomes? And this is a paper that Justice and I published a long time ago. We looked at this very simply. Are you meeting your target or not for hemoglobin A1C of 7.0? And what we found essentially is that those who had worse than 7.0 had more robust vision and OCT improvements, where those who had, were uh, greater than 7.0 had really a negative uh, effect to this. And I looked at this both in Rise and Ride and Vivid Vista and found very similar results that essentially, if you look at, again, on the um, x-axis here is the uh, amount of baseline hemoglobin NC and blood sugar, there was really no impact as far as final visual acuity. This was in Rise and Ride. And again, in Vivid Vista, you saw no extent to fourth quartile of hemoglobin A1C versus the first quartile, so essentially no uh, outcome improvement or outcome change with regard to that. Now again, if you look at the opposite of here, which is the laser therapy, this was the really quite interesting finding here, that if you decided to do focal laser in these patients, which what these patients were randomized to, it was a negative prognosticator when your hemoglobin A1C was higher with regards to visual acuity. And this followed the anatomy in those patients. You see on the purple there that the quartiles of thickness were different, and again, the flibrocept outcomes were all the same. Let's talk about just one last topic, which is around improvement of anti-VEGF therapy and retinal pr uh, practice. Again, we're all aware that retinopathy improves. Why don't people do treatment for diabetic retinopathy? I'm still uh, mystified by this. There's a lot of great data out there that shows that there's a lot of benefit. This is a patient with severe NPDR and mild NPDR following a year of therapy in Vivi Vivi Vista. And again, we know that vascular stability is better. Again, on the far two right columns, you see that in patients who are treated with flibrocept and panorama the, versus those who are treated with laser, or with nothing, I'm sorry, observation on the left side. And again, that shows vascular stability has improved with these drugs. And in fact, lower rates of VTCs, vision threatening complications, and central involving DME as a result of that. Uh, I guess if I was a diabetic and I had diabetic retinopathy, uh, I would rather be treated than to be observed for these sort of events and wait for the complications to start. So we looked at this and said, does the baseline hemoglobin A1C Im impact that? And the answer was no. Across all levels of hemoglobin A1C, there was no difference with regards to diabetic retinopathy severity improvement. There was a, a difference in the baseline severity, so that was definitely present there. And so that was concerning as well, and that you have baseline with the worst level of DRSS, the better chance of improving this over time. And this is the question that I think all of us wonder, is that is the improvement of di diabetic retinopathy severity by two steps or one step even going to help vision? And the answer was that we did this post-hoc analysis which was recently published. We looked at patients in Vivid Vista, and what we found essentially is when you look at this, that even though the anatomy ended up being the same in the far right corner, about a 200 micron improvement for baseline, the visual acuity was five or six letters different from those who had a one-step or two-step improvement in diabetic retinopathy, meaning that, that this improvement was a, a independent biomarker for vision over time. Again, in real-world clinical practice, we're not doing this. The majority of retina specialists, 60% or more, do not treat for diabetic retinopathy. They wait for the retinopathy complications to settle in before they treat. And again, this is why there's a disconnect in clinical practice, because many patients didn't achieve those outcomes. 60% of patients, even the sham arm, didn't get those outcomes. And again, we don't know the long-term risks, costs, and complications of this procedure, and that's why it's always concerning. So let me just finish off by talking about the real world. On the far right, you see all the related studies with visual acuity and the number of injections that relate to clinical practice. Here is actually the real world now, where we are in the, the circle, where it shows less injections are being given, less vision is improved upon. So we're not doing nearly as much to, to help this. We know that from the study that Alexandra did, and, and I did as well, that one single injection can cause a five-letter differential in DME patients. That's really concerning. These patients are on a significant need for these injections over time, and that's problematic. And again, we know the benefits of incremental injections. This is a study by Tom Chula, looked at each injection and how much vision that related to over time. So you have to get between seven and eight injections essentially in a year to keep patients at a level of vision that's gonna improve their vision. That's a really tough bar for a lot of us to hit in clinical practice. 
So again, the take home points are the following. Medical management is the foundation. Vision is the guidance point. Antivegf is first line therapy. And again, from the DR, the verdict is still out whether we tr should treat this or not. And thank you very much for your attention. Panel. So we have two questions from the internet. I can't read that far. <laughs> the first is, uh, to me actually, the FDA approved uh, ranibizumab, whatever the last four are, for the treatment of everything except DME and DR, and that's correct. Um, they did not get approval for DR and DME, and so the interesting thing is that they probably didn't ask for it. So other companies are looking, uh, are have submitted to the FDA, and the FDA has stated that if you get approved for AMD, you will also be approved for DME and DR. Um, so we don't know why the first one that got approved wasn't given those, but the thought is they may not have asked for it. Peter, does the dose difference matter? Nope, dose difference doesn't matter. Because that was my first question. Do you need to do another study with 0.3? Um, and the answer is no, you don't. Because the majority of the study is just about, I mean, the majority of the submission is about CMC and other things. They, they don't really care what the dose is as long as you show uh, similarities. Next question here is for you, Alexandra. Uh, you have a patient you're treating with a PDS who has endophthalmitis. What do you do? How do you treat it? So I think. I think it's um, very important uh, to educate patients about the symptoms they should be looking for because theoretically these patients are not being followed as closely as you would your regular neovascular AMD patient. And um, also uh, you need to really examine the patient's conjunctiva at the visits that you do see them. If you do have a patient with uh, endophthalmitis, as there have been several in the studies, uh, you treat them with, um, you know, you tap and inject like you would any any patient. There has been some reports of doing, uh, you know, injections of um, uh, antibiotics right into the implant, but uh, that's kind of used off label and it's uh, individual cases. So I'm curious. We'll go to we'll go to Mark, Phoenix, Arizona. PDS is available. What, what patient do you consider putting it in? How many have you put in? Sort of where does this fit in when you're thinking about treating AMD long term? You know, I, I think with the advent of uh, newer medications like, you know, Furosemab, where I can already extend patients without putting an implant in the eye, the, uh, the PDS is probably more of a, a niche agent for me, um, especially since we, we have good, you know, two-year data um, about the infection rates, but I, I wonder about the five or the ten-year data. Frankly, um, I think it, I think there's definitely a role for it. That there are some patients that just uh, can't come in or won't come in, and they they, they want to be that 98 percent at six months, and so they they move to. I have some patients that they they move to Ecuador or Honduras or something like that, and they only come back once every six months for their medical shopping, so to speak. I think those are great patients, and. The one other thing I would say, it's, uh, it's um, almost a little disingenuous for me to think that this is a six-month therapy when I look at first map and it might be a three-month or four-month therapy when that's the medium for one and the medium for this is probably much longer than six months. So perhaps this might be a one-year therapy, but of course that's off-label. So Alexander really highlighted for, for the fellows in the audience who may not have seen the surgeries to put this in or the refill procedures, Genetic Roche has really rolled out an excellent educational program. So, you know, when you get into practice, reach out to your MSL. They, they, there's a VR portion, there's a didactic portion, and they'll have surgical people there with you to help you through and learn this. You don't have to have been in the clinical study to, to do the PDS. Judy, Frisimab, we didn't really talk about it that much uh, this afternoon, uh, but it's FDA approved, of course. Uh, how does it slot in for your patients? Which patients are you using it on? So, um, Frisimab is easier adoption, I believe, uh, because uh, all of us have tried uh, switch therapy, right? Uh, we start with uh, uh, 
bevacizumab, and then may have gone to a ranibizumab, and then a flibercept. So at, as far as talking to my patients, uh, it's actually easier to switch to a furisumab than um, um, the susvimo or, or, uh, or, or the implant, for instance. Uh, I would uh, start on patients who are frequent flyers, who need uh, monthly treatment on um, a flibercept uh, and are not drawing. Uh, to see whether uh, with the uh, um, biphasic uh, effect that w we have uh, bi better drying uh, and as a result, uh, less frequent injection. So those would be the patients that I would start with. Uh, some patients may uh, be uh, living far away, uh, coming from a distance uh, or uh, have difficulty with rides. Um, those patients may be also a pa I, I could be talking to. So at, at Cole, we don't yet have it on formula, so won't ask any of us. Uh, how we thought about it, but Sunir, you ha do you guys have it already? Um, we have some. Judy, I have, I'm going to push you a little bit on that. The patient that I struggle with is somebody that I used ranibizumab on for a while, didn't really give me the results I wanted, switched them to a flibercept. They seem like they have a better anatomic response to a flibercept, but they're still coming in every four to five weeks on a flibercept. What sh how would you suggest them, but they're interested in exploring something else. What's your treatment algorithm for that patient to introduce them to furisumab or to susvimo? So if the fluid is not uh, um, uh, drying even after uh, switching to flibercept after three to six injections, I think that's probably a good time to start talking about uh, switching to another agent once you get the first first map on the formulary. Um, and um, um, you know, we don't have to worry about the endophthalmitis rate, uh, increased endophthalmitis rate. Uh, because it's a new medication, I think we need to, you know, uh, look for um, intraocular inflammation. But um, I just uh, learned uh, today that uh, over 20,000 injections have been given in the uh, clinical trials w with this medication. Um, and uh, the IOI rate is very low. So I think, you know, um, I have a lower threshold for changing to this medication. Yeah, I think the issue um, for brolocizumab, what we learned later about IOI, a lot of us are taking a slower course to using furisumab, um, which, is, which is probably smart, but, but the people who have used it, uh, at least the, the ones I've seen, have done remarkably well. Basel, do you have it in Cincinnati yet? You do? Have you, have you used it yet? I haven't used either yet. Uh, we do have access to both. There are a number of people at our practice <coughs> who are using it. Um, in conversations with some patients, uh, as far as susvimo goes, patients who are involved in the trial seem to be really happy with it if they have not had any complications, and they're basically asking how quickly can they get it done in the other eye. But when you're having that conversation with patients in the clinic who have not undergone the surgery, it seems like it's a much more difficult conversation to get mm -hmm. them used to the idea of surgery. Totally agree. So Dr. Martin, you're very trial-oriented. Um, the Apellus data for Pegcetacoplan uh, missed its primary outcome in one of the studies, made it in the second, and it missed it by probably, what, maybe 15, 17 patients max. But at 18 months, the nominal p-value was there in Derby. Um, how do you handicap it? Do you think we will be having a, a GA treatment later this year? Handicap it. Well, am I, yeah. I'm, am I asking? Is the FDA going to approve it? That, that what the question is. <laughs> the, obviously, I, I, I obviously I don't know. I would even when we had the 12 month data. I, a lot of people were asking me this. I don't know why they'd ask me, but they were they were um, if the 12 month data was good enough for FDA approval. Um, and and I don't I don't know. I think in the in the in previous uh, times probably not. But you know. With the approval of uh, of uh, aducanumab, the drug for Alzheimer's, which had zero data behind it, I think I think the well, no, it, it didn't. It, it was terrible, and and the agency approved that. But the reason they did, it really goes back to the HIV days. If you have a disease for that has no treatment and has a poor outcome, and you have a try, you have a drug that has some promise that's not toxic, why not make it available to people uh, to to to, uh, to try? That is a, 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 a general uh, direction I think the agency has sort of gone over the years. Certainly that's what aducanumab was all like. I was predicting with the one-year data they, they might approve it, but with the 18-month data, it looks even more favorable. Um, now the, the other question is, 
how are patients going to respond to that? I, I think it's a hard, it, it's an easy sell and it's a hard sell. It's almost like the PDT days where, where if I inject this drug, I'm preventing something bad from happening. And it may happen anyway, but it's going to be less bad. It's that same conversation. And it's re having lived through that era, it's hard. It's a hard sell. People bought into it. And if you've lost central vision in the one eye, you'll do anything. So I suspect a lot of people are going to want to try this. And I suspect I'll make that available to people. But, but it's, it's, um, it, it's not going to be as easy to sell as treating neovascular AMD where, oh, my vision's bad. I get shot. <clears throat> my vision gets better. That happens a lot. That's not going to happen here. You're going to have people, and they're getting monthly injections. And they're seeing 2020. 2025. It's a harder sell, but I think um, it's going to be interesting to see how our community deals with that. Well, I think it's an easy sell for that first shot. The yeah. 57th shot may be a hard <laughs> sell. Right. First shot's a piece of cake. Um, uh, last question. Gene therapy. When do you think, I'll, I'll give it to Mark. Mark was, gave us all the different methods of gene therapy. How do you think we're going to use gene? Let's just assume that, that one of these gene therapy products works, and we'll just say for now an anti-VEGF gene therapy works. Where would you put that in a setting of we have frisimab, we have port delivery. Um, at that point, maybe other treatments are, are around, although this is probably going to be the next one that will have phase three results. When would you do that in a patient with, say, AMD? Or let me rephrase it. Would you do it in a patient with AMD? You, you couldn't give me DR, could you? Uh, <laughs> no, that's why. DR is easy. DR is easy. Um, well, you know, they have to have demonstrated a consistent uh, and persistent and, and uh, almost monthly need. Um, if, if, you know, frankly, I don't like rocking the boat. If, if someone can go three months, perhaps four months with farisimab and they're stable, um, I don't feel a strong need to take that patient to, this, to the OR and do surgery. I mean, I mean, you can make this some of the similar arguments as with PDS, maybe a quality of life thing down the line. Um, but if you have a patient that, uh, with the best of our treatments, they're getting monthly, bi-monthly treatment over time, you know, doing a vitrectomy, for example, doing subretinal approach, or even a supercoil approach, where it's a, a single shot in the clinic. Now, the argument is, what's the approach? Are you gonna do multiple injections six injections, t 12 injections a year, or are you gonna do a single supercoidal? Question is how long will it last? So if, if you give me a supercoidal approach that lasts two years, that's a winner, right? Yeah. If you give me a subretinal that lasts five years, it's a no-brainer. So uh, any other questions from the audience? Hung Win. I like your picture on the internet, by the way. She, yeah, you, you, you're right now winning. I think you're like <laughs> one of the few. <laughs> uh, well, I have a question for Dr. Sarkier and uh, also So, so there's several visual cues. Uh, the, the, the whitening is usually when, when you're too deep, you're pushing on, on the RP and the choroid, and so you have to back off a little bit. In terms of knowing if uh, you know, stuff is coming out, it's, it's basically like if you do a retinal detachment case and you see schleering, you see instant schleering, that's, that's the IP. So you want that stuff to stay underneath the retina. And then, frankly, it's a question of the angle at, at which you're holding your instrument, or perhaps, frankly, perhaps you already widened the, um, the initial inc uh, incision too much, and you, know, you have to move on to the next one. But I, I think one thing to keep in mind with these therapies, uh, it's almost like an intent to treat. There's a certain volume that you want to get underneath the retina. And there's a certain amount of volume that you are getting underneath the retina, and you hope the discrepancy isn't isn't that much. That's that's the other thing to remember. And lastly, um, you do try. The whole point of doing a subretinal approach is to try to get as little in the vitreous as possible. So 
at the end of the case, if, uh, depending on the protocol, of course, if you do an air fluid exchange, or frankly, even if it does not call for an air fluid exchange, just actually doing a little bit more of a corvidectomy to remove any of that residual, at least debulk it, that's a good idea. Just to follow up on that, um, I think the last point is very important. Uh, I haven't done it for new vascular MD, but I've done it for IRDs. And it's sometimes really hard to see if you're getting any reflex. Like in your case, you did see some slurring, but sometimes you can't tell. And there's been even thought of tagging it so you can see it, but um, that doesn't quite work. And so the, uh, the drug that ends up in the vitreous, you really need to wash it out because there's all these concerns with inflammation. And it's possible if this uh, drug ends up in the vitreous that can cause postoperative inflammation. So we do, for, for RDs, we do fluid-fluid exchange and uh, fluid air exchange. Yeah, and, and what Kat showed in that study, they actually, it, you, you form a pre-bled with BSS, and then, so now you have a potential space and a hole, and then go into that second hole with the IP, uh, as opposed to Mark's case where the IP is what's making the bleb. So it's just different ways to do the same thing. And and then we, we in that study, they wanted two blebs just in case, thinking if there's any issues, you are have it in two different sites instead of one big site. We're learning as we go. We, we simply don't know the best way yet. All right. I was going to say that, you know, I think the gene therapy is so interesting to me, but you know, the bar has got to be really, really high for safety. You know, you know, you look at where we've been burned in the past few years. I mean, we have three drugs we use all the time for anti-VEGF, and now we have a fourth and a fifth. But the safety for the first three has been incredible. And so, you know, when you look at some of these therapies, I just wonder what the long-term safety of some of this gene therapy is going to be. It's an inherently inflammatory process. So... I don't think we understand yet what happens three years, five years down the road. And that could be pigmentary changes. That could be loss of function. And I, I think we just need a little bit more safety data before we make that big jump. But it's an exciting time. Absolutely. All right, guys, thanks. We have, we'll take a 15-minute break uh, and then do the second part of the uh, summit. Thank you. All right, if we could take our seats. So we're going to move on to the next section, which will look at some of the new imaging uh, devices, uh, as well as surgery. Uh, the first speaker is Judy Kim, who's going to enlighten us on home AMD monitoring. Judy. Thank you, Peter. I am so excited to be part of this exciting meeting with uh, many of my great friends from Cole Eye Institute. So thank you for the invitation. I really appreciate it. Um, you guys are in for a treat because I am going to talk about two new, brand new studies on home AMD monitoring during this uh, presentation. Here are my uh, disclosures. So when it comes to home AMD monitoring, there's the dry AMD and the wet AMD, right? For the intermediate AMD, we already have preferential hyperacuity perimetry, otherwise known as 4C home. Once the uh, eye converts to a neovascular AMD, hopefully in the future we'll have a home OCT uh, to monitor. The take home message of this talk is that remote monitoring programs combined with artificial intelligence technologies can support diagnosis of acute neovascular AMD conversion and will help monitor neovascular AMD therapy between office visits. So let's start with dry AMD. Preferential hyperacuity perimetry, PHP, is based on vernier acuity, which is excellent at detecting metamorphopsia. There was a randomized clinical trial called HOME study where um, standard care, AMSR grid or patient uh, uh, symptoms or office visits uh, versus standard care plus the fourth home device uh, were compared. The study found that uh, the uh, device arm had less vision loss at the time of neovascular uh, conversion compared to the standard care arm, 
and the percent of eyes uh, maintaining 24-year better visual acuity at coronary neovascular membrane diagnosis was 87% in the device arm compared to 62% in the standard care arm. Now, this is during a clinical trial where patients were closely observed and followed. In real life, it is even more starkly contrasted. Percentage of patients with 20, 40 or better at the time of uh, wet AMD diagnosis is only 34% based on iris data. Why is this important? Because better visual acuity at the time of diagnosis, conversion to neovascular AMD, means that with treatment, they will maintain good vision at two years. The eyes with poor vision at uh, diagnosis improve vision but they never get catch up to the 2040 or better level. So this is important. So the first study that I'm going to uh, talk to you about, hot off the press, I uh, just accepted uh, uh, in ophthalmology retina less than two weeks ago, is this ALOF study. How do 4C home remote mind telemonitoring perform in real life over time? So this was a retrospective review of records of all the dry AMD patients who were monitored with Forcium device in five clinics over 10 years. 3,334 eyes of 2,123 uh, patients uh, were included in the study. They were uh, monitored for an average of 3.1 years. And there, uh, they used the machine 5.2 uh, times per week out of 3,334 uh, eyes. 285 eyes converted, 8.5% converted to wet AMD. This um, uh, calculates out to annual rate of 2.7%. While 48% of the eyes were detected based on patient's a symptom or during routine visit to an uh, eye care specialist, 52%, additional 52% were detected based on a uh, 4C home device. Once they converted, uh, 6.4 injections were given with anti-VEGF per year. They were concerned about lots of uh, uh, non-CMB-related alerts, uh, meaning false positives, but there was average of one in every 4.6 years per patient, so there was no increased treatment burden. This is important study. When the patients converted to neovascular AMD, the median visual acuity was 20 over 30, uh, 39. And once they started treatment with the most recent uh, visit, visual acuity was 20 over 32. So they continued to maintain good vision. 20, 40 or better visual acuity was seen in 84% at the time of conversion. And with treatment, 82% maintained that. This is in stark contrast to real life, again, with iris registry. In real life, when patients come in and get diagnosed with a neovascular AMD conversion, their visual acuity is mean, the mean of 20 over 83. So PHP remote monitoring helps us to detect CNB conversion at a better visual acuity than standard care. And the uh, importance of that, again, is because when we detect at better visual acuity at baseline, then we can maintain good vision for these patients over at least two years of treatment. Let's move on to a neovascular um, AMD with home OCT, uh, where patients self-image at home, each uh, imaging takes less than one minute per eye. 88 B scans are taken uh, during in the uh, 10 degree uh, central view of the uh, retina, and the uh, OCT images are all uploaded into the cloud. Then the monitoring center performs AI-based quantification of fluid. In addition, the center helps with insurance verification, compliance monitoring, alert management. The retina specialists can set the fluid volume threshold to let the uh, uh, monitoring center know when to, they want to be uh, alerted. In addition, the retina specialist has access to all the data because they're all up in the cloud. And if you review these data at least once a month, you can bill for that. 
So recently, um, in ophthalmology retina, there was a prospective study with home OCT that was uh, published. In this study, 29 eyes of 15 subjects uh, were enrolled. Mean video, uh, visual acuity was 2040, ranging from 2020 to 20 over 200. With home OCT, the visual acuity uh, has to be better than 20 over 320. Uh, the duration of the study was three months. There were 23 uh, eyes uh, that had wet AMD, while six eyes had dry AMD. And if the patient tries to uh, image themselves, uh, they were successful in 96% of the time. And there were over 2,000 uh, images uh, that were uploaded and reviewed. The patient's weekly scan frequency was 5.7 days per week. And if the patient did not uh, scan themselves two consecutive days, then the uh, um, monitoring center will give them a call. There was a median of one reminder call for monitoring center over three months per patient. Self-imaging session duration per eye was median of 40 seconds. And as you can see, the standard deviation bar decreases over time, which suggests that patients progressively got more proficient, better at self-imaging with this device. Manufacturer signal quality index, MSI, ranges from zero to seven, and two or better is considered a good image quality. And the mean MSI parameter with these OCT, uh, image, uh, OCT was 4.4, uh, and uh, MSI of two or better was seen in 97% of the over 2,000 images. When patients are seen in our offices, we get just uh, one shot at each time point. However, with home OCT, we can get multiple uh, uh, information in between those uh, images uh, regarding volume and location. So we can get better information about the disease dynamics and treatment response, and we can even get this trajectory uh, uh, graph, fluid volume trajectory. So here is a patient where both eyes need to be treated. And uh, you could see that the right eye probably had a little more fluid than the left eye at the time of uh, second visit. However, if you had home OCT, you could see that the right eye was sitting on a large amount of fluid for a lot longer before they uh, had come into the office for that injection. So with home OCT, we can personalize uh, when they should be treated, and if we could personalize it even between two eyes. And here are uh, images from six different eyes demonstrating the heterogeneity of this disease uh, dynamics and treatment response. This is like the EKG of the retinal fluid. We can also see whether the fluid is intraretinal or subretinal, whether it's center involving or um, not center involving. And we can um, um, get the fluid volume quantification in nanoliter. So here's a case where there is a center-involved subretinal fluid evidenced by green bar and uh, green graph, and then uh, it improves. But when the injection is given, when the fluid is less, uh, you see that the improvement is more rapid and robust. And this second case with the intraretinal fluid now, uh, uh, evidenced by the purple graph, and um, uh, it shows that there's a rapid uh, decrease in uh, fluid following injections. So, in summary, patients can self-operate these machines, and with teleophthalmology, with home diagnostic devices, coupled with artificial intelligence and digital healthcare uh, providers, can help close the care gap between office visits, help us to get more data, and hopefully end up with better visual acuity for our patients. Thank you for your attention. So next speaker is Andrew Brown. Andrew is a fellow with us, and he's now at UC Irvine. Andrew's going to be speaking on application of deep learning in VR surgery. Great, good afternoon. I should start off by thanking my mentors, because now that I'm trained fellows, 
I have to thank you for all the times that I might have made you sweat a little bit more than you wanted to on that day. So, yeah, he had brown hair when, when I started. <laughs> um, so today I'm going to talk about um, kind of an investigational project. It's not clinical yet, but hopefully it will be uh, soon. So uh, first we'll talk a little bit about AI's impact in ophthalmology, but that's going to be covered in more detail later on, and deep learning as a tool in vitreoretinal surgery. So within science, there are so many tools that have really revolutionized our ability to make discoveries, X-ray crystallography, PCR, OCT in clinical ophthalmology, and AI is, is permeating everything that we do as a new tool. Artificial intelligence is the general category, and when more recent years, machine learning and even deep learning has emerged as a subfamily of, AMD, of uh, AI. We've of course seen the publications looking at diabetic retinopathy, retinopathy of prematurity, really impressive publications looking at color fundus photographs, a very simple technology, but really revealing a lot about disease in the population. And at, uh, at our institute, Gavin Herbert Institute, we've started to have forays into various ways of using AI to enhance uh, our, our, uh, our tools that we can use in vision science and also surgery. So here's actually, um, maybe someone can play the video. This is actually um, something that Ken Lin, one of our glaucoma specialists, has done with the trabectome surgery, where you can see uh, in real time the delineation of the trabecular meshwork to help to guide the surgery. So what our goal uh, has been is to have a, a, a VR surgical view where we can ad automatically identify the tip of the instrument. We ca can identify whether the instrument's in contact, near, in an intermediate distance or far away from the retina, and then whether it's a forcep and on which side is the instrument being inserted. We really don't have any objective tools to study how people do surgery and how the manipulation of instruments inside the eye impacts the outcomes of the surgery. So being able to autonomously, in a retrospective fashion, characterize all these features of surgery, we may start to be able to objectively study surgical technique. So our approach has been this, and I'll talk today about the in vitro part. We wanted to have an optimized system that was very simple to try and see how well an AI system could function at determining these different parameters about the instruments as they move through the eye. And so we, had a, we have an in vitro system where we choreograph a dance. We know exactly how we're moving the instruments through this model system. We take labeled data from surgical video and we train a neural net to, uh, to identify the surgical instrument parameters. And eventually we will also have a piece of software that you can basically, like playing the piano reading music, you can watch your surgical video and annotate in real time retrospectively, of course. So we acquire surgical video, train the convolutional neural network, and hopefully be able to eventually provide real-time feedback to surgeons, objective data for research purposes, and maybe even automate operative reports. So our first goal in this realm of, of research um, was to characterize instrument parameters for their location in 3D space, their instrument type, and their laterality. We have this in vitro system where we record surgical video and move instruments at different depths throughout the eye to create thousands of video frames, individual images that can be classified by AI. And we train the neural net to be able to perform that task. Here are some examples of, of videos moving through this in vitro environment. Again, this is not a real surgical scenario. Uh, this is a model system that we created. And you can see these instruments moving around. Um, and all the data that's acquired from these video frames, 30 frames per second, is used to train the neural net. So here's a, our 3D printed model eye. We created a, a custom illumination system that varied the illumination direction so that our system could function independent of where the light pipe essentially was inside the eye. And then we had a VR surgeon um, acquire uh, uh, many different uh, surgical uh, um, videos and then she moved the instrument from different depths with different instrument types. And so here's how the, the instrument, uh, the, the in vitro system performs. We can see um, that the, there's a little gray circle at the tip of the instrument as the AI detects where the instrument is inside the eye as it moves around through different quadrants within the, the VR space. In the top right, you can see um, where the instrument is relative to the depth of the, of the vitreous cavity. And you can tell on the bottom right that there's a flex loop inserted into the eye. So you can also see as the video is playing if the lights are moving around uh, 
360 degrees, you could imagine it being like a chandelier or having a light pipe that's moving dynamically. And you can see now that the flex loop is actually in direct physical contact with the retina um, as it is dragged across the retinal surface. So again, this is just a model system, but it proves that we can have pretty accurate data for objectively extracting information from surgical videos um, after the surgeries have been performed. We trained with over 50,000 images, we tested with over 50,000 images, and the model was accurate for the depth of the instrument 97% of the time, and 100% of the time for what type of instrument and its laterality. So in conclusion, this in vitro um, bit of investigation proves to us that annotated surgical videos can train deep learning models to identify and track surgical instruments in the 3D vitreous space. So our next step is this, we want to implement software that anybody can use to, to annotate their surgical videos because we don't want to train an AI based on a single surgeon. We want to train it based on everyone in this room and everyone beyond. So here's the, um, the beta software that we started to develop where we calibrate the software. It'll be very difficult to see, I'm sorry, the, the green dots you can see um, on the tip of the instrument. We can locate where the tip of the instrument is and throughout the surgery, just like playing a mu musical score, you just move your hand around on the touch screen and, uh, and, and annotate the surgical video. Again, the goal is to provide real-time surgical feedback, objectively extract data from re uh, for research purposes, and even automate operative reports. And I think that's my last slide, except for acknowledging the people who did all the work. Some people in my lab, as well as our computer science colleagues at UC Irvine, and the support for the work as well. And with that, thank you very much. Thanks, Andrew. Very cool stuff. Uh, next speaker is uh, the newest member of Cole Eye Institute, Phoebe Lynn, is going to be speaking on imaging in uveitis. Thank you so much for this opportunity to share a little bit on uh, the utility of ophthalmic imaging in uveitis. So excited to join the team and the family at Cole Eye. Um, so the problem that we have and the reason that ophthalmic imaging and uveitis is so important is because it's not just a single disease, as you know, it's actually a large collection of heterogeneous diseases that present in a wide array of presentations, including the wide variety of presentations of anterior uveitis, intermediate uveitis, and posterior involving types of uveitis. And so the problem that we have in uveitis that can partially be solved by ophthalmic imaging is kind of tried and true, you know, both uh, was present 20 years ago and is present now. And the first is, how do you diagnose uveitis? Traditionally, this is done by pattern recognition. For instance, we perform examination. It's a certain pattern that we see based on history that we take, a thorough history as well. But, um, but ultimately, multimodal imaging is going to improve our accuracy of classification and ultimately of diagnosis. The second big question that we have or problem that we have in uveitis is how do you determine clinical activity and response to treatment? Again, traditionally we did this, um, physicians would grade AC cell, grade vitreous haze, perhaps count the number and qualify the type of chorioretinal lesions you see on examination. And ultimately, perhaps you can get a more objective and perhaps more reliable quantitation via imaging in various modalities. However, there actually are, you think that imaging actually would be more objective and more reliable, but there actually are limitations. And ultimately, it's going to require a combination of our clinical skills and the imaging that we have available. And then finally, one of the problems with uveitis is our prognostic indicators and, of course, identifying risk factors that might develop complications in our patients who have intraocular inflammation. So there are various modalities that we use, fundus photography, such as pseudocolor imaging or a split spectrum imaging on fundus photography, fundus fluorescein angiography, ICGA, fundus autofluorescence, different types of OCT, including EDI, enhanced depth imaging, and OCTA, and finally, ultrasonography, but I'll probably only have time to go over a couple of these that we utilize the most. Now, our algorithm, there really is no algorithm, just like in, in terms of diagnostic tests, like certain blood tests, there's, there really should be no algorithm that we use. The last thing you wanna do is throw everything, including the kitchen sink at the patient in terms of imaging. And what you should do is tailor your imaging selection on exam findings and history, and ultimately, based on knowledge on whether or not these imaging findings will change this patient's outcome. At the same time, you don't really want to be afraid to utilize your tools together, and that's 
that's multimodal imaging, and that's because that additional piece of information might actually enhance your accuracy of classification, ultimately also give you that prognostic information that a young patient might require for the lifelong disease that they might have. And so we'll just start out with the first case, so talking about classification or diagnosis. So this is a 41-year-old woman who was referred with a referral diagnosis of AMPI. She did have these kind of like very vague, kind of yellowish, deep lesions, and really the most striking feature of her fundus examination were these multi-loculated um, serous detachments in the posterior pole. And it was in the other eye too, so it was bilateral. The uh, fluorescein angiography showed, again, these multi-loculated areas of pooling, as well as these hyperfluorescent spots. The fundus autofluorescence was corroborative, meaning you had these multiloculated areas of hyperautofluorescence in the areas of the serous RDs. And then ultimately, the OCT gave very um, important information. That was that this patient had bacillary detachments, and there's a differential diagnosis just for that. AMPI is included in that. There was also increased cortical thickening on enhanced depth imaging OCT, which, again, you can have in AMPI as well. And then a very striking feature were these subretinal fluid pockets that were separated by septae on the OCT. And ultimately, the ICGA kind of sunk, you already kind of form your differential as you see all these findings, the ICGA showed you this very kind of um, constant and diffuse pattern of hypocyanescent lesions throughout the fundus. And this patient almost definite, definitely had Vokoyanagi Hirata syndrome. And that was in the absence of things like tinnitus and dysacusis, and actually in the absence of, you know, very a prominent AC or vitreous cell in this patient. So how do we know this? Well, the standard uveitis nomenclature or SUN working group published a whole slew of papers in uh, taking up an entire issue of AJO in 2021, where they use machine learning on data sets um, from standardized forms, including examination findings, history findings, and imaging findings, as well as other testing. And they actually were able to identify, here, I'll just go back, they're able to um, identify classification criteria using machine learning for 25 of the most common uveitic entities. So just to give you an idea of that patient of mine that I just showed you, these are the key criteria for early VKH that this machine learning algorithm established. And the first is exudative retinal detachment on examination. Well, there's a differential associated with that. What if they don't have the panuveitis that's thought to be um, highly associated clinically with this condition? Well, it turns out that imaging findings are very important in, in uh, accurate classification, and it's the appearance of these um, uh, FA appearance, it's multi-loculated appearance on FA or septa on OCT that give you uh, these criteria, are included in this criteria, or you could have the panuveitis with the headache and tinnitus and dysacusis that you know of from the clinical criteria that was established in the past for VKH. Of course, the patient can't have a history of penetrating trauma or VR surgery, and you have to rule out syphilis and make sure they don't have syphilis, as well as imaging findings that might suggest they have sarcoidosis instead. And in fact, using these criteria, the misclassification rate was very low at 8% and 7% in their training and validation sets. So just to give you an idea of one of the other um, one of the other diseases that was classified using this approach for serpiginous, uh, as expected, um, you're required to have choroiditis with this amoeboid or serpentine shape, and imaging findings are again a, a feature of this uh, of this diagnosis with the characteristic FA block early stain late at the borders, as well as the fundus autofluorescence findings of hypoautofluorescent lesion with hyperautofluorescent borders. They you have to have absent and mild AC cell and vitreous inflammation and the exclusion of other potential causes like tuberculosis and syphilis, of course. And actually, the misclassification rate was 0% for both the training and validation set using these criteria. So here we have um, high accuracy of diagnosis and classification using more than just um, exam findings. And you know, you kind of like the, that need of this just shows the data that's behind um, the need for imaging as well as examination data. So I'll go a little bit more about the utility of OCT in uveitis outside of uveitic macular edema, for which the, the, um, the importance is, is very obvious. Other markers for disease activity have been described, things like retinal nerve fibrillary thickness as a surrogate for optic disc edema, but overall activity of uveitis, cortical thickness on enhanced depth imaging, perivascular thickening as well, and, and the utility of uveitis in, uh, for prognostic indicators as well as to distinguish complications of inflammatory disease processes in the eye, such as CNVM. 
So very obvious, just like in the retina world, in the uveitis world, for uveitic macular edema, central macular thickness or, sub -so or central subfovial thickness correlates very highly with visual acuity. The caveats to that are other findings on the structural OCT, and those are things like easy loss, ellipsoid zone loss, and, and disorganization of the retinal inner layers that can also um, be highly associated with visual acuity. Um, this group, the Cole Eye group, has done a really great job at looking at quantitative features uh, on OCT that are probably more objective and perhaps can serve as better endpoints for things like clinical trials. So AC cell quantitation using OCT. A number of groups have looked at perivascular thickening in uveitis, so this is not necessarily cystic thickening of the macula, but actually perivascular thickening more globally in the macula as a surrogate for activity. And this is actually a study in birdshot patients, which is you know traditionally a little bit difficult to tell clinical activity. And so perivascular thickening as a surrogate for clinical activity in, in birdshot patients. As I mentioned earlier, RNFL thickness. So this study looked at RNFL thickness as a surrogate for uveitis activity and was able to distinguish between inactive and active states of uveitis as well as very highly discriminate between uh, uveitic patients and healthy controls. So this is a now kind of a well-known marker for early VKH activity, the presence of cortical thickening on enhanced dense imaging and optical coherence tomography, which we can follow, not as, not as useful for late VKH, but for early VKH, certainly a good marker for clinical activity. It's not specific, so it does pertain to other uveitic entities as well, with cortical thickening being present in birdshot as well and can be follow, followed clinically. This study was performed by Lorenz and Alfredo, uh, Victor Lorenz and Alfredo Adan in Barcelona and their team. And what they found was that using swept source OCT and breaking down the various quantitative findings, including AC cell quantitation, a relative intensity of the vitreous to RPE intensity on OCT, as well as this kind of very generic average thickened retinal index. So it's not looking just at uveitic macular edema, but just global thickening of the retina. And using this approach, they developed what's called a uveitis activity score via this multiple linear regression process. And they found that this uveitis activity score was highly discriminant for active versus inactive disease across a broad array of uveitic entities, as well as being able to distinguish between the uveitis patients and healthy controls very discriminately. So then moving on to complications, as you know, you know with lesions, uh, for, for instance, as in PIC, sometimes it is difficult to tell between active processes such as cordial neovascular membranes and an inflammatory lesion. And so we can see that although we can see lesions on fundus autofluorescence, there are three new lesions in this particular patient that they identified, only the OCTA and then also the ICGA was able to tell that one of those three new lesions was a cordial neovascular membrane. So in terms of peripheral vascular leakage or the use of uh, ultra-wide field forcing angiography, in this particular patient with pars planitis and new NVD, you might wonder and, and um, uh, probably guess at why this would have occurred now that we use um, wide field so often, but you can see that there's peripheral vascular leakage and peripheral non-perfusion. And that's probably the driving factor for this NVD that you wouldn't have necessarily seen on examination alone. So when we looked at patients with peripheral vascular leakage in uveitis, we found that it was by itself associated with other um, types of complications of uveitis like optic disc leakage and cystoid macular edema. And the group at Cole, um, Dr. Sharma, Dr. Srivastava, and Dr. Fenkat, who was here for a while, um, showed that they can actually quantitate vascular leakage on ultra-wide field FA quite nicely. And it, really, the jury's out on whether or not OCTA will provide a nice surrogate using things like vessel density on the on-foss OCTA as a surrogate for, um, for leakage on FA. And so I'd like to conclude with that ophthalmic imaging in uveitis is, is actually essential. So it's not just this ancillary thing that we do um, to, to kind of you know, help, help people diagnose a mystery case. It's actually crucial to accurate disease classification, it turns out. It informs the course of disease and treatment efficacy. So in other words, you can use various types of imaging to quantitate um, various markers, uh, surrogate markers for activity. And this is especially important when we're talking about endpoints for clinical trials where we have to combine different uveitic entities together. And then finally, for evaluation of complication and, per, uh, and also to provide the patient with inform 
information on prognostic indicators like easy loss in drill in uveitic macular edema. Thank you so much. This is um, a figure, or this is an image created by an artist named Juan Osborne who puts together many words into these, these famous um, images of, of, um, of um, paintings. And, and so it's just to illustrate that really a picture is worth more than a thousand words. Thank you so much. So reminding you again, if you want Bose headphones and you don't want Hung Win to win it, hashtag we want our headphones, um, <laughs> go ahead and submit. Um, it, there will be a drawing. So the way we're going to do this is anybody who actually does this, I don't even know what Twitter is, um, <laughs> then we will do a drawing at the end. So it's fair. Uh, the next speaker is Basil Williams. Um, he is going to speak on surgical approaches to intraocular tumors. All right. I'd like to thank the uh, committee for inviting me to speak. Uh, I'll be talking about uh, mostly choroidal melanoma, um, but we will touch on some of the principles that we think about when we do surgery on other tumors as well. Uh, so these are my disclosures, which are not relevant. So the goals and objectives are really to highlight some of the unique risks when you're doing vitreoretinal surgery in patients with intraocular tumors, talk about some of the precautions that you should take, and then talk about the range of uh, surgeries that are done. So we know tumor seeding is obviously a concern. This is especially if they have not been treated. Um, there's concern for PVR as tumor cells uh, can sometimes get access to the vitreous and then kind of sit on the surface of the retina. And then we also know that, uh, especially for choroidal melanoma, it's in the choroid, so it doesn't have a lot of retinal effects itself. However, uh, the effects of radiation on the retina and the uh, future ischemia uh, can be challenging. So here's a couple of examples of tumor seeding that have happened. Now, this is mostly with older, uh, larger gauge uh, surgical platforms, uh, but it is something to keep in mind. And so when you're thinking about surgery, the most important thing, not just in surgery but for procedures, is know where the tumor is. So if you're seeing a patient that, is, that had treatment for their tumor elsewhere and they're going to you for injections for radiation retinopathy, you obviously don't want to inject into the tumor. So think about that before you do the injections, and it's obviously important for surgery as well. Cryotherapy is something that's uh, debatable, uh, and then sclerotomy for suture closures. Uh, so this is one of the first cases that I did uh, during fellowship, and really the goal is just, you can see how beat up and, um, and inflamed and scarred the conjunctiva is. And so in a lot of these cases, post-radiation especially, you can deal with some really, really challenging uh, conjunctiva. You can also, uh, you also should check and see if any muscles were disinserted at the time of original surgery because that can cause tenons and conjunctival scarring to the muscles. And so sometimes when you're trying to create a pyridomy, I've actually seen a fellow start to uh, disinsert a medial rectus muscle in an area of significant scarring. So it's just important to keep in mind. And then cryotherapy can be particularly helpful if you're concerned about vitreous seeding, if your tumor is broken through Brooks membrane, um, et cetera, and then suturing the sclerotomies is kind of important in general. So there's a range of surgeries that are done. Uh, fine needle aspiration biopsy is probably the most common uh, that's done. And so transscleral is usually reserved for anterior lesions, and you can kind of see here the approach. So you have a transilluminator on the other side of the eye, uh, and then you take a marking pen to mark the area of where the tumor is. And so obviously this is going to be important for an anterior lesion in this approach to make sure that your needle is going into the lesion. You also want to know your lesion thickness because that's going to change the angle in which the needle goes into the eye. So if you have a pretty flat tumor, you obviously want to take a kind of oblique angle. And because uh, you're going directly into the tumor, we do cryotherapy immediately uh, even before the needle comes out. Now, if you're doing radiation right afterwards and radiation is going on that area, then you don't necessarily uh, need to cryo. And here's kind of what you see uh, globally as we have somebody else kind of aspirating um, at the time of the, the needle is in the eye and you can see the sawing motion uh, that was happening to kind of shear some cells and then we do cryotherapy immediately afterwards. So here's an intraocular approach, and actually for most of these, I was trained in my fellowship to use the indirect, um, but that's a little bit more challenging because everything is upside down and backwards. And so uh, if you're doing these, um, you can do a vitrector-assisted approach, or you can do a needle um, through a trocar, and you don't have to have an infusion line in. 
Um, so this is our fellow trying to decide where to go and avoid one of the blood vessels. Again, you can see kind of a sawing motion there, um, this kind of large atypical lesion. You can see some subretinal hemorrhage, and that's when they released uh, pressure outside. Uh, and then after the needle comes out, you can see that trocar coming in, and that's because they're depressing in the area of that trocar uh, to maintain hemostasis. And we cut off the video here, but the blood didn't increase anymore after that. And that's a fairly large tumor, about seven millimeters in thickness. The larger the tumor, the more likely you are to get uh, some bleeding afterwards. Here's another approach, uh, courtesy of Peter Hovland, and I've been using this more uh, for some of the smaller tumors. I used to just bend the tip of the needle, and so when you'd go in, you'd have an angle to get under these smaller lesions. But using a 41-gauge cannula uh, can actually be pretty helpful uh, to get into these small lesions and then aspirate. Uh, and then again, you can see kind of in this scenario the, the sawtooth pattern. And uh, because of uh, the kind of translucent edge, you can actually see some of the pigmented cells, or at least imagine they're pigmented cells. You can see some debris or material um, that kind of enters there to make sure or to feel more comfortable that you got uh, a decent sample. And again, you can see with a smaller lesion and also a smaller um, uh, smaller entry that you are less likely to get bleeding. So with these approaches, a lot of patients have vitreous hemorrhage afterwards, at least some amount of vitreous hemorrhage, but very few actually require surgical intervention. Um, here is uh, a case actually from pretty recent, the fellow, mm, okay, it doesn't show up, but it was just a non-clearing vitreous hemorrhage. And the importance of that, again, I normally start uh, nasal for non-clearing vitreous hemorrhages in diabetics, thinking about the real estate. If there is a traction detachment, you might be um, eating nasal retina, but it's at least the safest area to go. With tumors, again, you really want to make sure that you know where the tumor is located uh, and how thick it is, uh, because as you kind of go deeper with the vitreous hemorrhage, you want to make sure you're not then eating into the tumor. Regmatogenous detachments are pretty rare. Uh, they can either be there already or um, as a tumor gets treated, a hole can develop. Um, they are considered to be more complex uh, as they have lower uh, reattachment rates. And so uh, longer, ta longer acting gas, tamponade, or oil is often considered in these scenarios. Exudative detachments we see all the time. Um, they can really be uh, prominent in some of the larger tumors. And so the challenge is do you we know that they go away over time, but if you leave them for a while, the fluid can damage the retina and decrease the vision. So do you do an internal approach where you're creating a break that was no longer there? Do you do an external approach where you're concerned about uh, iatrogenic spread into the orbit? So it really depends on the situation. So here's a patient post-treatment who had a significant exudative uh, retinal detachment afterwards. Um, and so, you know, in, uh, a paracentesis was made to place an anterior infusion, uh, and then afterwards you can see uh, some kind of uh, cotton from the wax uh, they used to kind of absorb some of the material, and then there's a scleral cut down, a little cautery to try and reduce the bleeding, a pre-placed suture, and then you drain. And uh, this does make me a little bit concerned doing it, as you can see kind of that uh, dark material uh, draining into the potential orbit. So clearly you only want to do this after the patient has not only been treated, but you've uh, seen very, very good regression of the lesion. But uh, I tend to do uh, an intravitreal approach. And this is the outcome afterwards with silicone oil placement. Uh, macular surgeries are pretty standard. They don't really necessarily, you don't change your approach uh, from regular. Here's a patient with this multi-lobulated melanoma. Uh, and and before, uh, before radiation, they actually had a very, very small hole. After radiation, the hole increased a little bit and afterwards uh, did well with the peel and kind of a straightforward approach. So endoresection is something uh, that is done in some countries, especially when they don't have access to radiation, at least as a primary treatment. I don't really use it as a primary treatment. However, we do know that there are a bunch of very large tumors uh, where you can get tumor lipid exudation syndrome. Basically, after good radiation, you can get kind of necrotic tumor cells that continue to keep the inflammation, and even with injections, they don't necessarily respond. So sometimes I will do endoresection on those very large tumors after radiation and after good regression to try and reduce that uh, inflammation. And so uh, here's a case from South America of a primary endoresection uh, with exudative detachment. And I think one of the things that's important to keep in mind, so it depends on where your tumor is located. On this, a very large anterior lesion, uh, they do a peripheral retinectomy and then kind of fold the retina over and then access the tumor. Uh, I have a case that I don't know if we'll get to show later, but uh, uh, of a posterior lesion. 
um, that we ended up just going directly through the retina uh, to eat the tumor. So after taking care of the clot, uh, you then uh, go in and you can use a larger gauge, 23 usually for this kind of surgery, uh, and then you uh, eventually uh, eat the tumor. Now I think you, know, you can pre-place some laser and some cautery around it uh, as well. I think one of the biggest challenges and one of my biggest concerns when doing these cases is you now have access to the choroidal vasculature and you're worried about with your infusion whether or not you're gonna access the choroidal vessels and then that could potentially send an air embolus. Uh, so uh, it is a little bit of a, a scary surgery to do. Um, I used to be a little bit more aggressive in terms of getting all the tumor out down to the bare sclera, but if they've been treated with radiation and had significant regression, uh, you can leave some of the uh, residual tumor scar in place, and theoretically that'll reduce your risk uh, of an air embolus. Um, and so you can see in some of these cases what the outcome looks like, and some of these patients can do very well, but obviously it's not uh, without some level of concern uh, or challenge. And so basically intraocular surgery is safe in the right scenario, especially if you're a retina specialist that's working with an ocular oncologist who hasn't been trained in surgical retina and you're doing these cases for them. Uh, it is important to know where the tumor is, especially if they have a vitreous hemorrhage uh, and you can't see in right away. You wanna know when you're placing your trocars where to go, utilize appropriate precautions, and then consider a more aggressive tamponade when necessary. Thank you. Our next speaker uh, is Yasha Modi. Yasha is going to tell us when is OCTA helpful in clinical practice. All right. Well, thank you. I, I, you know, every time I come to this Cole Summit, I'm reminded of how incredibly lucky I was to be a fellow here. Uh, we have just such an incredible crew of people. Those talks were amazing. And Basil, I'm so glad I'm not removing tumors intravitrally. So. So we're gonna talk a little bit today about when OCT is helpful in clinical practice. These are my financial disclosures. I will show Zeiss OCTA images, but I'll also show some Heidelberg OCT images as well. So for those of you in the audience, who uses OCTA on a regular basis? Great, so it seems like we have a very small number of individuals who are actually using it. And you know, so let's just go dive right down into the, into the bad parts of OCTA. Well, one of the things that's really frustrating in clinical practice is projection artifact, whether that's from vitreous floaters casting a shadow on the retina or something that we sort of take for granted where we see larger superficial vessels projecting onto the deep capillary plexus where they know they don't exist. There, the other problem is when we think there is a CNV or not, and we're actually looking at a projection artifact that can frequently lead us off of the clinical trail. So the other thing is motion artifact, and fortunately, uh, eye tracking software has certainly made this less of a problem, but these are difficulties in OCTA that make it difficult to interpret. But now I wanna spend some time talking about the good. So here's a case of a flow overlay on a cross-sectional OCT showing a beautiful type 1 neovascularization underneath it. And here's a wide field swept source OCTA in diabetic retinopathy showing a large area of peripheral neovascularization with non-perfusion. So these are beautiful images that really tell us a lot about the pathophysiologic states of these two conditions. And the research in OCTA, the question is, are we overcomplicating this? You cannot read a journal today without some complicated paper looking at some quantitative parameter on OCTA, whether that's FEZ area, vessel density, and fractal dimensions. This is a part of everyday clinical research in retina. And my view is that these exploratory metrics are essential to help us better understand the prognostic and clinical application of OCTA. But for now, we can ignore this in the clinic and sort of simplify our approach. So I'd like to share with you a little bit of what I do and probably what I've learned from a lot of the panelists up here. First, reject or repeat image acquisition with high projection or motion artifact and then use cross-sectional flow overlay and compare that to ONFAS imaging as I've showed from the images down below. Those images are from Phil Rosenfeld. And then if you ever get lost, run through the cube and actually go over to the machine to get better sort of correlation between your cross-section and your ONFAS image. 
So the way I think about this is we have retinal vascular circulation and then we have a deeper cortical circulation. As it pertains to the retinal vasculature, OCTA provides us invaluable information on non-perfusion, neovascularization, and remodeling. And one of the features of neovascularization is really to use the uh, cross-sectional image with the vitro-retinal interface slab to identify flow above the retinal surface as you can see from neovascularization elsewhere on the bottom right image. Here's an example of active neovascularization of the disc, and you can see that cross-sectional flow overlay over the optic nerve, and this is what it may look like when it's regressed, where we see that sort of fibrous tissue over the disc, but when you actually do OCTA imaging, what you see is that all of the flow signal is now within the retina and not in the epipapillary space. In terms of remodeling, we can see this as a case of a chronic branch retinal vein occlusion where we see this superior temporal remodeling. And we can differentiate that from arterial occlusions where we don't undergo that remodeling, but rather a reduction in the superficial capillary plexus and deep capillary plexus density. So when we think about the choroidal circulation, the entire premise of this is, is there a CNV or not? We have neovascular non-exudative AMD without exudation, and this entire classification really has been born out of the work in OCTA. Here we can see that flow signal that I showed before on the fibrovascular pigment epithelial detachment. And then we have the inverse scenario of non-neovascular AMD with fluid, where you see no flow in those uh, pig, um, pigment epithelial detachments, but we see this sort of slight bleb of subretinal fluid. And so we could easily consider treating that, but with OCTA, we can make much more informed decisions and potentially avoid treatment. And then of course, the obvious scenario is neovascular AMD with exudation. Here we can see an incredible amount of SREM with flow signal through that indicating a type two neovascularization. And so one of the situations where I find OCTA to be very helpful is in the differentiation between chronic CSR and CSR with choroidal neovascularization. And if you look at those early and late ICG images, you'll see a large draining choroidal vessel and then what looks like hyperpermeability, which is a classic feature of CSR, but it's diff difficult to inf confer or infer that there is in fact neovascularization. But when you look at the OCT, you see potentially this double layer sign and OCTA clearly indicates that there is in fact a choroidal neovascularization where we may wanna consider anti-VEGF therapy. And something that's not as well described in the literature is this idea that there's an overlap between CSR and AMD. And this is a patient of mine on the, uh, in the bottom left image there, in the right eye, we can see small drusen consistent with early macular degeneration. And then in the left eye, the patient comes into me symptomatic with a bleb of fluid. And what I've noticed is that the bleb of fluid is dramatically larger than what you would otherwise expect for exuded macular degeneration. And with OCT angiography, I don't see a flow signal in the pigment epithelial detachment where you would otherwise expect neovascularization to be. I see this patient back three months later. Now I'm seeing a little bit of a bleb in subretinal fluid in the right eye. And then in the left eye, we're still very much stable and I'm not seeing a flow signal on my OCT angiography. And so this is a person that we've talked about PDT potentially, and the person has frequently opted out of it. But this is one year later. This person did receive one aflipercept injection. I think I was nervous at that time and maybe thought I was seeing type one neovascularization. But I can use my OCTA to dramatically lower the frequency of treatment in this patient that might have, might have otherwise been classified as exuded macular degeneration. So I wanna consider the use of OCTA in some relatively cool cases. This is a patient who came to us not too long ago. It's a sad story of a 30-year-old 30 gentleman. He has sickle cell, he's had bilateral avascular necrosis, and he also has had an episode of acute chest syndrome back in 2018, and he presents with acute decreased vision in his right eye. There's bilateral disc edema, but if you look at the right eye, there's venous tortuosity relative to that of the left eye, and if you look closer, you'll see that the macula is white, and it's sort of subtle, and like kind of in, with an incomplete uh, cherry red spot. If you look at the OCT, what you're seeing is hyperreflectivity in the middle retinal layers. And if you look at the OCT on FOSS images, you see this area of deep capillary plexus dropout. So this is a case of CRVO with secondary globular PAM in the setting of a sickle crisis. And this person underwent a plasma exchange with our hematology service.
So this is case two. Here we see cavitary loss in the macula. And it's sort of easy to go and look at this and say, well, there's a whole host of things that this could potentially be. But when you get an OCT angiography through this patient, what you see in the deep capillary plexus is this temporal vascular remodeling. And this is nearly pathognomonic for macular telangic type, MACTEL type two. And in the left eye, you can see this beautiful perifoveal grain, a right angle venule. And in the right eye, it's a much more advanced case of a, uh, sort of RP changes and crystalline deposits. When you look at the OCT, of course, the right eye is more advanced than the left eye. Uh, that helps make the diagnosis. So for the last case, this is a 39-year-old female four days of hypopsias and a few floaters. She had a cold about three weeks prior to presentation, and then COVID-19 vaccination two weeks prior. So a lot of immunogenicity going on here. Visual acuity is 20-20 in the right eye, 20-20 minus in the left eye. And if you take a close look, what you see is these placoid multifocal lesions. And so this is not a diagnostic dilemma. To anyone in the audience, you probably would know that this is a case of AMPI. But when you look at the imaging, and especially when you're looking through the segments, what you'll see is this hyperreflectivity in the outer nuclear layer, as well as disruption of the ellipsoid zone. And this is one of the differentiating features between AMPI and MUDES, where frequently you don't have involvement of the outer nuclear layer in MUDES. And if you look at the ICG, you have both early and late hypofluorescence, which gives away the diagnosis. But the reason why I'm bringing this up in an OCTA talk is I want us to focus on that one segment superiorly in the right eye. And if you look at the OCTA and you look at the chorea capillaris slab, what you're seeing is incredible flow voids in this area. And again, in the left eye, you can see again those sort of multifocal areas of flow void changes. And when you juxtapose that to the ICG, you can see incredible correlation between the ICG and the OCTA, potentially meaning we didn't really even need the ICG in the first place. So six weeks later, there's a resolution of those uh, sort of placoid lesions. The OCT demonstrates improvement in the outer nuclear layer and relative reconstitution of the ellipsoid zone. And when you look at time zero, and then at the bottom, six weeks later, you can see that the flow voids improve both on the ICG as well as on the OCTA. Notice in the left eye, the flow voids haven't completely resolved, but it tells us that OCTA is a very good surrogate for following patients with ampi to resolution. So I think that there is clinical utility to OCTA in clinical practice. OCTA research has already provided prognostic value in retinal disease, and we didn't talk about the research side of this, but remember that incredibly important paper by Phil Rosenfeld that identified a 15-fold increased risk of non-exudative neovascular AMD progressing to exudative disease at one year. And simplify your review of the OCTA and ensure the appropriate software tools are available uh, to add value to your everyday practice. And then I think we have one more cool imaging and surgical case that we'll discuss in the surgical panel. Thank you. Thanks, Yasha. And uh, next is Justice Ehlers. Justice is going to talk to us about the role of AI in retina. Thank you. Thanks, Neil. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and, and thank you for all uh, for, for being here. We're going to a whirlwind tour through uh, some of the things that we can see with AI and in retina. These are my financial disclosures. So why do we need AI, precision medicine, and image-guided metrics? Uh, when we look at it of the way that we manage our patients, we want to optimize our diagnosis efficiency, we want to more quickly and accurately risk stratify our patients, determine treat, re treatment risk and benefit, and enable an individualized therapeutic approach. And we'd love to have targeted clinical trial enrichment uh, and to understand our failures when we see our patients in front of us, and overall to improve our economic models. So is AI the answer? Well, it's gotten tremendous uh, fanfare in, uh, throughout medicine, uh, but there's also some caution around how do we deploy this within our clinical care. So where could we use it? Well, perhaps everywhere, but more specifically, we could look at automated detection of disease, perhaps disease characterization of severity grading, assimilating big data to help us understand our diagnostic accuracies, and enabling next generation use of some of our current technologies. And that's what I'm going to mainly focus on for this talk, and to enhance some of our current platforms to improve that efficiency, and lastly, looking at pattern recognition and phenotype classification. So what do we need for training? This is something that's talked about a lot. We need data sets of sufficient size, annotated or raw images. We want to understand the thought process of AI and what happens when things go wrong. 
So when we look at this, one of the early places uh, that we've heard about is in diabetic retinopathy, where AI systems had similar uh, performance to what ophthalmologists did in grading the severity. And this led to the first uh, approval of an AI-based image diagnostic in medicine, which was the IDX system for identifying more than mild diabetic retinopathy. This used an AI-based uh, platform to look at fundus photos and was able to have a sensitivity of 87%, specificity of 90%, and importantly identified all those patients who had more severe retinopathy. As uh, Judy alluded to, we're now seeing this in terms of potential uh, home-based monitoring and using AI technology to better understand disease processes as well. What about det detecting systemic features? So we might be able to tell in a relatively easy way if this individual is male or female. It becomes more difficult here. But if we asked you to actually identify if this individual is male or female, it would be quite difficult for the people in the audience. But AI systems have been shown in different studies to be able to do that. And even digging in more to look at things such as cardiovascular risk factors, being able to look at BMI, age, gender, all based on a single fundus photo. And when we look at the attention maps, you can understand why is systolic blood pressure focusing on the blood vessels. Pretty impressive power. One of the real biases that I have and I'm going to mainly talk about now is how can we use this in our imaging to go to next generation image characterization. We heard a little bit earlier of some of the work that's been done in quantifying angiography and being able to look at leakage in, an, in a new way. Well, what if we apply essentially the next generation systems to be able to use AI in a different way to better assess our ultra wide field angiograms? This could include being able to look at the region of interest, being able to remove artifacts, being able to identify ischemia or the optic nerve. And we've been able to do this using these systems across uh, different platforms to identify the optic nerve, be able to re remove those frustrating artifacts that we use in terms of what we want to do for analysis, and being able to better look at leakage. For example, is perivascular different than generalized? Or can we look at leakage dynamics over time and the velocity that we see when we look at leakage in specific diseases? One of the other areas we want to look at is vascular features. We've seen these beautiful images in OCTA, and multiple groups have shown that using machine learning technology, we can better segment vessels in fluorescenes. We wanted to look at this in ultra-wide field angiography, but to build those training sets is quite hard. Here's the original ultra-wide field angiogram. We contrast enhanced it, and then luckily the people in our labs didn't leave when we asked them to actually annotate these to create the data sets. But this is the output that you then get, is this machine learning segmentation that's really beautiful that almost looks at the level of an OCT angiogram that we can see across the panretinal area. This is a normal eye here. We see just really incredible detail of uh, the retinal vasculature. We see proliferative diabetic retinopathy where we can see these foci of neovascularization, areas of ischemia and dropout, and really beautiful visualization here of sickle cell retinopathy with dropout here. And using this technology, we can then pull out multiple different metrics. Some of the ones that Yasha alluded to maybe are totally useless, but they actually may help us better understand how we can you know, look at the diseases that we see using some of this next generation segmentation. The last part I'm going to talk about is OCT, and this has obviously been looked at with multiple groups uh, around the world and in different areas. And we've seen that using automated OCT segmentation with machine learning can increase our accuracy. Glenn Jaffe at Duke was one of the first to show some of the opportunities in automated segmentation and then be able to apply machine learning to improve that accuracy and be able to do it in a more efficient way. We've been looking at this similarly, particularly with an interest in the outer retina, as well as in specific pathology feature extraction, and being able to look at things such as ellipsoid zone integrity and in some of the diseases where that may matter most. With this, we can do compartmental analysis where we can look at things such as ellipsoid zone loss, areas of geographic atrophy. And for example, in Plaquenil therapy, this is something that I'm always challenged with in clinic to be able to visualize subtle changes here. And I found more and more as we use our technology, there's more cases uh, than what we realized previously. But if you look at these maps, it's not hard to identify which eyes have the disruption of their ellipsoid zone compared to if you were only looking at the B scan. And when we think about screening and identifying these patients earlier, this technology could really be incredibly helpful. What about dry AMD? We heard earlier in a couple of talks the exciting avenues that are coming. We want to know in these early patients who we should treat and who we shouldn't. This is an intermediate AMD eye. We see the significant disruption in the ellipsoid zone integrity. And just two years later, this is their subfovial GA that has developed. We looked in this study, this is an example of an eye that didn't progress, where they have really consistent ellipsoid zone integrity across the macula with still significant drusen burden. And when we looked at this in a machine learning classifier, we found that ellipsoid zone integrity measures were really the most important, including some of the other validated qualitative features that predicted progression to GA on a rapid basis. That's not my next slide. <laughs>
maybe. I'm at least going to get 40 seconds back. Yeah, I think it was the 60 slides in 10 minutes. So, uh, so when we look at this, uh, the other thing that we can look at in DryMD is actually therapeutic response. And we've looked at this with a few of our partners. This is, uh, as Kat discussed, uh, the elamipratide uh, Reclaim 1 study. And what we found was that looking at ellipsoid zone integrity was directly associated with visual acuity improvement. Eyes that were already past a certain point didn't show a, in a response to the drug compared to those eyes that had subfovial preservation. One of the exciting things is can we use then the more black box approach of machine learning to look at at-risk lesions? This is some recent work where we're looking for essentially what we call like sick ellipsoid zone lesions that potentially show the at-risk areas that might show directionality as well as the speed at which the new GA lesions may develop or where they may go. We look at also quantification. Historically, we've looked mainly at fundus autofluorescence, but now using AI-based technologies, we can actually quantify the amount of GA on OCT in an automated fashion that actually very strongly correlates with fundus autofluorescence features. The last thing I'm going to talk about here is really how we can look at fluid characterization. We heard a little bit about this from, from Judy, and the really exciting things that we can see in being able to volumetrically characterize this. And numerous groups have looked at this, ranging from the original uh, development of essentially manually segmenting this to then graph-based technologies, and then moving on to machine learning, which really allows us to do this in a much more efficient way, and now starting to see this deployed in multiple different commercial approaches. This is an example here of the deep learning uh, confidence output of where we can see both the intraretinal fluid and subretinal fluid here, and that allows us to actually pull out different parameters, including things like macular hole volume, being able to look at changes that occur during surgery, as well as specific compartmental assessments such as intraretinal fluid or subretinal fluid, and how that may impact visual acuity outcomes as we look at this. One of the areas we've also looked at is retinal fluid index. What's the relative burden of fluid relative to the tissue? Some of the things that may help us explain why there isn't good correlation in visual acuity and outcomes to central subfield thickness. We looked at this in the phase three VISTA trial trying to look at the entire comprehensive picture of the OCT in a compartmental assessment. We see the traditional retinal thickness maps up above in this in a representative case. One of the interesting things that we found is that there's progressive ellipsoid zone integrity improvement in these eyes with fluid resolution, with ongoing stability. And we heard about the concerns about the volatility that may affect overall outcomes. And this may be part of it is that over time you get progressive ellipsoid zone loss in those eyes uh, that are more volatile. We're able to actually quantify those changes and, and then show how it's linked to, uh, to visual acuity, as well as being able to look specifically at compartments uh, that we may have interest given a specific disease. One of the exciting things is, you know, the challenges that we've seen of lack of correlation between OCT findings and visual acuity. But now what we're seeing is using these specific compartments, we can find strong and robust correlations with visual acuity outcomes that may actually help us with new and future endpoints to look at some of our new therapies uh, going forward. So what's left? So there's a lot of excitement in this field, and I just touched on uh, some very small areas here, as we saw from Andrew's talk, some really exciting work of how we can integrate this into our surgical practices. But I think for when we look at this from a medical care standpoint, I think this may enable a whole new level of precision medicine and retinal care. We have so many therapies coming out. How do we pick which patient gets what drug? It may be that AI-based technologies may help us profile these patients in a unique way. There's a tremendous amount of research that's needed and really a partnership between academics and industry to help us get uh, to the point where we can deploy this uh, clinically going forward. I want to thank my team uh, at the Cleveland Clinic and thank you for your attention. We're going to um, continue on. We're going to, uh, we have food and such for the break, but we're going to get to it right afterwards. We'll finish the program so we can finish on time for everybody. And we'll still do the drawing, so don't worry about it. <laughs> you will get your chance to win these headphones. So uh, our next to last speaker before we go to the panel, Senior Garg. Senior, thank you for joining us. What we've learned from the COVID-19 pandemic, changes in retina practice that are likely to stay. All righty, thanks, Neil. So, you know, the pandemic is, we're sort of kind of getting out of it. It's interesting how quickly we all went from masking to very few masks in the audience. Um, it sort of sucked, and, but you know, there was some good that came out of it. You know, my house got fixed and all the broken things that were happening got fixed. Uh, my kids actually knew that I lived in the house, so that was awesome. And I got to finish, finish and do a bunch of research projects, so we'll talk a little bit about that. Most of it will be about prevention and prophylaxis of enophthalmitis during intravitreal injections. We'll talk a little bit about povidone iodine, chlorhexidine, speaking, and then mask use. 
So povidone iodine is still really the only agent that's been shown to reduce the risk of endophthalmitis, at least in cataract surgery. And that study came out 30 years ago. It's widely used, it's cheap, you can find it everywhere in the world, but some patients really hate it. And they hate it because it messes up their cornea, so much so that some patients say that I have an allergy, and I'm sure you guys have heard that every week, that I don't want that stuff because I have an allergy. Let's talk a little bit about iodine. Iodine was first isolated about 200 years ago in France, and the vapor of iodine has a purplish hue or a purple haze, and it was named after the Greek iodes. I don't know how to you know, speak Greek, but nonetheless, which means violet. Then in 1873, a French researcher found that it had antimicrobial properties. And in 1908, tincture of iodine was first used to sterilize the skin for surgery. Povidone iodine was discovered in Philadelphia, go Philadelphia, in 1955. <laughs> and it has several advantages over regular iodine. It releases free iodine slowly. So the reason that povidone works is because of free iodine. But it's much less irritating. So if you think povidone iodine is irritating, <laughs> wait until you got fresh iodine causes less toxicity to the skin, doesn't stain the tissue a bluish purple, it's longer lasting, and it has slower absorption in the soft tissue, and it's more soluble. And it's on the WHO list of essential medicines. So we hear about allergies, but a true iodine allergy probably does not exist, partly because it's just too small to be um, allergenic. Your thyroid needs it, and we pretty much eat it all the time whenever we have table salt. And even if patients say, you know, I'm allergic to contrast, how many people have asked that question, are you allergic to contrast? Um, probably doesn't really matter. Povidone iodine is probably okay. One study looked at patients who had a known contrast allergy. This is like the CT dye or something. But when you tested their skin with it, only about 10% of people had an allergy. And when you looked at different brands of contrast, there was very little cross-reactivity. And if there is an iodine allergy, it's probably not the iodine, it's all the stuff that's mixed into the iodine. The other question we often ask is, do you have a shellfish allergy? Oh, maybe I shouldn't do povidone iodine. It's actually not the iodine that people are allergic to. It's some of the muscle proteins, the tropomycin and the parvalbumins that are the, the players. There was one case of true anaphylaxis after povidone iodine, and that was in a kid. One thing that you shouldn't do, like all of us hate the patients who come in and are like, oh my God, I'd rather go blind than have my eye burn all day long and I'm gonna keep calling you every hour. And so there's this thought, well, let me be nice to the patient and skip the povidone iodine and perhaps I'll just use topical antibiotics instead. Maybe I'll pre-medicate you for a few days beforehand like the cataract guys do. So there's a series out of Mass Eye and Ear and Dean McGee that looked at five eyes of five patients who actually had the Mercy antibiotic regimen and none of them got povidone iodine. Of those five patients, they got a total of 53 shots and all of them developed endophthalmitis. So don't do that. There's another series that did that as well. The incidence of endophthalmitis was one in 300. Don't do that. Then in the DCR net, there was also three of these pity cases, three eyes, only took 13 shots for all three of them to get endophthalmitis. Or, um, anyway, so don't do that. That would make you sad. So there's an interest in finding alternatives to povidone iodine. One of the things that's sort of been popularized recently is hypochlorous acid. This is the same stuff that people use to treat blepharitis. One study looked at 5% povidone iodine, 2.5% povidone iodine, as well as hypochlorous acid, and they found that the 5% and 2% povidone iodine were pretty much the same, except they thought maybe 5% was better um, for prophylaxis against strep. But they found that hypochlorous acid was meaningfully worse. Now, some of our colleagues have published other data to suggest that maybe it's just as good, but I think the preponderance of data suggests it's probably not as good. So perhaps just stick with povidone iodine based off of this. Another option of chlorhexidine, at least in our scrub sinks, you have two different scrub brushes. You can choose a betadine or povidone iodine scrub, as well as a chlorhexidine scrub, so it's a great antiseptic. But a lot of the chlorhexidine that's available will say on it, do not irrigate your brain, meninges, or the eyeballs with this stuff, because it's often mixed with alcohol, and the alcohol will cause a bad epitheliopathy. There was a study out of Australia that looked at aqueous chlorhexidine. That means basically an alcohol-free preparation of it. And they did 40,000 injections with really low-dose chlorhexidine, 0.05% or 0.1%. And they only had three anaphthalmitis cases. That's an incredibly low rate, regardless of the series that you look at. They thought only one of those patients had a suspected allergy. And they noticed that the patients seemed to be more comfortable with it. There was another study that looked at 40 consecutive patients. The first 20 got povidone iodine. The second 20 got chlorhexidine in one eye only. And they found that the pain scores were worse with the povidone iodine and they found that the culture positivity was pretty comparable. 
So we did a study looking at patients who are coming in with bilateral injections. We took 50 patients, randomized one eye to povidone iodine, one eye to chlorhexidine, looked at their pain scores, looked at the cornea, which causes me shudders to even think about the fact I looked at the cornea, <laughs> and then cultured the conjunctiva. Our primary outcome measure was the Wong-Baker score, or the smiley face score, and we looked at these other things as well. The long and short of it is there was a significant reduction in pain immediately after the shot, but post-op day one, it trended towards significance, it didn't meet significance, because half the patients really didn't have pain regardless of what you did. But for the other half that had pain, those, the eyes that got chlorhexidine were way more comfortable than the eyes that got povidone iodine. That was true immediately after the shot as well as the next day. When you look at the cornea, the cornea was a lot more beat up with povidone iodine, but an easier way of looking at it is just with fluorescein. The top is with chlorhexidine, the bottom with all the PEEs is in the betadine group. So you can imagine why the patients are so miserable. Culture positivity was pretty similar between the two groups. So the take home points here is for patients who hate povidone iodine, aqueous chlorhexidine is potentially a really good option. So masks. We all started wearing masks, but before the masks, we had a debate in our group about whether we should wear masks or no. We couldn't come to a consensus. Most of us had adopted a no-talking policy, which is basically just shut up before you do the shot. And then some of us wore masks. So out of 400,000 injections, it didn't really make a difference. So if the doctor wears a mask, he doesn't do squat. That's the take home there. But then the pandemic came around and everybody started wearing masks. So this was the study we wanted to do. So we looked at a series of time, about six months before the pandemic and a six month after the pandemic. Um, this is the cover of Retina Times. The bottom left-hand corner is Judy Kim. Hi, Judy. Still looking great, even with the mask. Um, we looked at 500,000 injections. The incidence of dendritic myelitis was 1 in 3,500 in the no face mask group. So this is basically no talking, but um, no face mask, and dropped to 1 in 4,700 in the universal face mask group. But because the incidence is so low, even with 500,000 injections, we still, we still weren't powered to detect a difference. But if you look at the culture positive cases, there was a meaningful difference. One in 11,000 in the no face mask group, and only one in 23,000 in the universal face mask group, and none of those eyes had developed endophthalmitis from oral flora, and that was significant. So the take home message here is the universal face masking seems to prevent culture positive endophthalmitis as well as endophthalmitis from oral flora. But not all masks are created equal. This was work that was done by one of my colleagues, Ajay Kurian. And basically, he had people lie back and wear a petri dish on their head and wear a bunch of different masks and see what the cultures were. And the basic take home here was an N95 mask was the best at preventing culture of bacteria, whether or not you were talking. But a tight mask, a tight surgical fitting mask, was actually sort of bad. And we've all experienced this when we're at the slit lamp. Sometimes our lenses fog up when patients are wearing certain types of masks because some masks are tight so the air has to vent somewhere, the breath has to vent somewhere so it can vent toward the eyeball. But when we tape the top of that mask, all of a sudden the culture positivity or the culture place went down. So the take home here is if patients are wearing a tight fitting mask, if you're gonna use that mask, there may be some advantage of taping the top of it We've tried to tease out whether that makes a difference clinically, but again, it's such a rare event that it's hard for us to say so. Okay, so in summary, endophthalmitis happens no matter what you do. Antisepsis is critical, antibiotics are not. There's alternatives to povidone iodine. That alternative is probably chlorhexidine is our next best option. And at a minimum, don't speak. It'll be interesting to see what we do now that the pandemic recedes. Will we continue to wear masks in the office or will we go back to the way that we were? Only time will tell. Thank you very much. Thanks, Sunir. And uh, open up for questions as Sunir's sitting down. I'm going to ask Sunir. All right, Sunir, tell us what you're doing in your clinic then. Are you using povidone iodine or are you using chlorhexidine in your, for your patients right now? Well, I'm basically using povidone iodine. The problem with chlorhexidine is just, it should be super cheap, but it's not super cheap. So either you have to get it from a compounding pharmacy, the cheapest that I can get it for is 30 bucks a bottle, but it has an expiration date of 28 days. Mm -hmm. So that becomes an issue. And then for most of the pharmacies that mail it to people's houses, the cost is meaningfully more. And so that's an impediment there. Baxter has a bottle, which is about 20 bucks but it's only good for 24 hours. And so then if you start multiplying that across the practice, that ends up being a huge expense. And so I can't get it cheap. If I could get it cheap, I'd use it because the patients 
really like it a lot. Those people who are, you know, just like I, I call, they call me every single time they're in the office at 6 p.m. I get a, you know, phone call, the eyes are burning and irritated. When you switch them to chlorhexidine, those phone calls go away because they're way more comfortable. Yeah, have you ever think about charging patients for it? I mean, as a premium, it's a premium injection. You get chlorhexidine and nice. your mask taped yes. and an N95 <laughs> and maybe a foot massage at the same time. I mean, I mean, this is a Wills thing, right? Can't we right, do this? Right. That's how we roll. Yeah, yeah, no, no, we don't do that. <laughs> Dan, work on this. This is cool. Yeah, go ahead, yeah, Judy no. and then uh, Yasha, sorry. Yeah, I, I uh, find that sometimes the patients with dry eyes, uh, severe dry eyes, are even more either by uh, povid and iodine, so sometimes I have them use uh, more aggressive uh, um, artificial tears uh, for three days prior to coming in, trying to alleviate some of that dry eye plus a povid and iodine effect. Yeah, sure, you're gonna say something? No, I, just, I was just a follow-up question to that. Like, have you done the economic analysis? For, like, what's the cost of uh, iodine, like, you know, povidone and iodine, like a bottle? And, you know, do you just hold on to it for a month or you throw it away at the end of each clinic day? or? Well, I don't think that it gets thrown away. Um, <laughs> but, you know, we go through a ton of it, so, but it's probably, we keep it for a few days, whatever that might be. On Fridays, they get pitched. They don't get kept over the weekend. Mm -hmm. um, but the povidone, it's because of the chlorhexidine, I can't, no matter how I get it, when I get it in a similar size bottle, it still ends up being like 90 bucks a bottle or 100 bucks a bottle, which last I checked, povidone was still pretty cheap. It may have gone up recently because of the pandemic stuff. Um, but there was a meaningful price delta. So when we did a back of the envelope calculation, it would end up being like 20 grand more per doc or something. So it's a it's a meaningful delta. Has anybody used the uh, uh, Kitrolec uh, for uh, post-injection? Yeah, so that seems to help too. Um, the topical non-steroidal, you know, I have the patient put in a drop before they leave and a drop before they, you know, after they get home. And that also seems to cut down pain meaningfully. I don't know, I, I've, I've used it uh, uh, for some time, but I think it's more of a placebo effect. <laughs> so <laughs> I've stopped using it, but uh, I think some patients truly believe in it. Uh, some, uh, one of my patients actually came with a paper, <laughs> you know, saying, can I try this? I had, I had one patient where, although I don't think she has an allergy, she clearly has horrible reactions. No matter how little we put on, she'd send me pictures of what her eyes look like, and she gets bilateral. And so I sent her to cornea to try to figure out what we could do, and, and she actually takes steroids you know, topically, and that, I haven't tried Qtorolac, but you know, she does it usually for two days after the injections, doesn't use it preceding, it's made a huge difference, and we can still use the povidone iodine. So, you know, I'm curious, so you were one of the first people who really made me start thinking about not talking and about the idea of mask wearing you know, with in injections, and the pandemic has now opened these doors for us to do it without, I remember when some people would walk in, you'd be worried the patient would think, oh, something's wrong with them, because they were the only ones doing it. Now we can do that. Do you see as mask requirements change and your patients aren't coming in with masks and you may or may not be wearing masks, it still seems like that door's really open that when you go back to the procedure room to say, okay, now everybody's throwing their mask on, what are you gonna do? Yeah, so I don't know. That's the short answer. I like wearing a mask personally because I've gotten less colds and stuff than I did before. Um, but with the patients, you know, and Philly's still a little bit more pro-mask than some places in the country. But patients are sort of fed up with it. And then the question becomes, are they going to carry a mask into our office? Probably not. Or if they do, it's going to be the same crumpled up one that's been in their pants since the last injection. Right. And then am I going to provide a mask? And then there's an expense for that. Yeah. And so, you know, and it's a pretty rare event. So is it worth the money? I don't know. I found uh, mask wearing has decreased the amount of patients talking in a UVI's clinic that's incredibly important. So <laughs> <laughs> free masks for everybody and uh, at Cole Institute. Any questions from the audience? I can see a couple and I'm sorry, go ahead, right, right there, yeah. Yeah, so that's a great um, point. So the question was, what about dilute povidone iodine? And I had removed that stuff from the talk. One of the really, so one of the really interesting things about iodine is more is not better. And there were studies done in the mid 80s in some of the surgery literature looking at the free iodine concentrations. And they compared 10% all the way down to like 0.1%. And the peak free iodine concentration was at 1% povidone. So that's where you actually got the highest amount of free iodine 
meaning likely the most amount of antiseptic uh, property. And so there's a great deal of scientific rationale to that. Um, and another interesting thing is it doesn't seem like higher concentration works any faster. The only potential drawback of the lower doses, and there's some people who are sort of revisiting this idea during cataract surgery of just irrigating the eye with a quarter percent povidone iodine, is it doesn't last on the surface of the eye as long. So potentially more frequent applications or an application right before you actually put the needle in, there might be some advantage to that. But that's a really great cheap idea. We just don't have a robust data set on it. There was another question. Go ahead. Thanks for the question. I will answer the first one and I'll leave the second one to others. Um, <laughs> so, in <Second> one. <laughs> I'll take the second one. <laughs> okay. So, uh, Dr. Martin will take the second one. Uh, you know, all of us have uh, detected uh, um, non symptomatic uh, conversion uh, from a dry to wet AMD based on OCT alone. So, yes, it is a very attractive thought, isn't it? And um, uh, it is possible that if one eye has converted uh, from dry to wet, it can go on to home OCT, and perhaps the, the second eye can be monitored with OCT until the um, uh, possible for possible conversion. Uh, the um, the issue is probably the cost. Like a lot of things in life, it all comes down to money. You know, how is it going to be? Um, distributed to all the patients with intermediate AMD, which there are a lot of, and uh, how is it going to be paid, and how it's going to be, um, in, you know, how the ma machines are going to be available, and all that. So I think it would be uh, more the, uh, the cost issue. And then the, I think your second question was getting at um, intervening earlier, and s rather than waiting until people have some evidence of GA. So that is, you, you, it's a fantastic question. So you're younger than me, so you're gonna have a lot more years to figure this out, okay? And I'm personally gonna challenge you to do that because there's a lot of people who are, who are trying to figure out that exact question. Many people feel that, that you know, the point where we're intervening now, that, that kind of the horse story out of the barn, that, that we're, we're treating a very advanced disease. Uh, what everyone wants is to intervene earlier. And so there, is a, there are a host of studies that are either happening or are Planned and you know, DRC are. I'm very a extremely actively involved in this in this conversation right now. Uh, the ones that are that are that are currently ongoing is the Macustar study that's being done in in, in, in Europe. Uh, Frank Holtz leads that, um, it, which is focused on trying to develop earlier endpoints. Um, uh, Vasada and the CAM group have done a fantastic job of trying to really define earlier disease. So you've heard serora and irora, which God, I hated those terms when they first came out because they're just not intuitive. You ought to come up with, surely you can think of some sexier name than that, but that's what we're stuck with, right? Serora and irora, the incomplete, or now happily it's kind of being replaced by nascent GA. And it seems pretty clear that nascent GA does seem to be predictive for going on to, to serora. But you want to intervene earlier. And so we're actively designing studies to try to enter to look at intermediate AMD <coughs> and risk factors uh, for that and who progresses and who doesn't. The problem is once you get that early in the disease, because that's where you want to intervene. The problem is, is that the predictive, it's going to be very difficult to pick out someone who has a 80% risk of progression that far back. That's the trick. Because if you don't figure that out, then you're going to wind up doing, you're going to have to treat huge numbers of people, most of whom do, don't need to be treated. So that's the holy grail right now to me, is figuring out earlier who's going to develop geographic atrophy. All right, we're going we're gonna to show a couple of surgical cases. Um, we asked some panelists to um, uh, show us or send in some videos. I'm going to actually start and ask Peter. How did you repair uh, inferior detachment, single break, six o'clock, 55-year-old person? I'm old. 
I like buckles. Okay, you're gonna buckle. Would you drain this in your old age? And uh, your my, you know, your presbyopia is pretty bad at this point. And I mean, there's not not a ton of fluid. I mean, certainly we'll, we we will drain in the bed of the buckle. It's easy to drain, um, but I wouldn't need to drain it flat. Like I wouldn't do multiple drainage. Or I wouldn't do a cut down. Okay. All right. So Yasha, when you drain, how do you? What's your drainage technique? Do you have a particular way you like to drain? Nothing fancy. Just uh, actually, don't cauterize the bed. Just stick a 30 gauge uh, right on the um, side of the buckle. All right. So I was going to show my video, but actually, Kat's video is way better at showing how uh, she drains. Kat, this is your case. You just did with Jess, I think, just uh, recently, yep. one of our fellows. H how do you drain? How did you, what would you do for this case? Um, I really like chandelier buckles for draining. I feel like it's good for teaching. It makes me feel better when there's a fellow involved because I feel like we share visualization. So this was my first time actually using. Um, sort of, well, we'll get to it. I typically have <laughs> just done like the hand skim needle, but um, we use something different here. This is us finagling with the cryo at full for a little bit. Um, but we use the Vortex, yeah, external drainage uh, depressor, which we don't have an external shot of, but it's really great. You can actually just externalize the needle. You can really see where you are um, and sort of get that sort of controlled visualization while you drain, which I think is really helpful. Um, so I, it was my first time using it. We use it. This was the patient was like 16, and the detachment had been there for like three or four years. You can see all the subretinal bands that are there. But I think it went really nicely. I don't know if anyone else does chandelier. Yeah, I, I, I do chandelier buckles. I like the. I, I used to do a needle drain technique. I like this um, a vortex subretinal uh, needle. Justice, were you going to say something? You had, had any thoughts on it? No, I mean the, this one. I definitely would have approached it the way Cat did. You know, in a 16-year-old. 55, I probably would have done a buckle bed yeah. um, for that. Because my general view is try to not drain. Gotcha. Dan, reverse pneumatic for you. Is that what you're doing for these now at this point? <laughs> Pretty much. Okay, good. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. <laughs> All right, Kat, this is your, your case. I don't think I – could you hit play on this video? I'm so sorry. I didn't have it go automatically. Um, <laughs> tell us about your case that you're doing here. Yeah, Hung Ween did this case with me. Nice job. Uh, I forget how old this patient is. I think they're in their 50s. Uh, they're fake kick. Uh, I think they're fake. Um, and they had a GRT that was present. Um, and so you can see that the GRT is present from like 12 to 3. And then they also had some additional a horseshoe tear superiorly to it. Um, we decided to do a buckle vit in this case, which I think is a discussion on its own. But when I saw those other horseshoe tears mm -hmm. superiorly, I just felt like I would really appreciate having that sort of extra support. PFO, I think, is definitely your friend here and that you could really see how mobile everything is um, to really just be able to stabilize so you can really sort of shave the um, peripheral gel as good as possible. So um, the phacic patient, does anyone here make these patients pseudophagic when they do this kind of case? Anyone do a, a phaco at the same time? Peter, I know you do a lot of combo phacos. Would you do a phaco in this one? Not, not in this case because I'm going to be making it more near. I do most of my combos are macular cases. Um, in this case, I would just leave the lens and, you know, have them have cataract surgery when their prescription stabilizes. All right, is someone going to someone gonna tell me that they do a primary vit? I'm not afraid of you saying you do a primary vit. There are people here who would disagree with you, but anybody do a primary vit on this kind of case? I do. Excellent. Tell us what. Tell us, uh, tell us your reasoning why and go for it. Well, I found that uh, I don't need to do buckle in these cases. I can get really good shaving and cleaning up of the edges and a good laser and make sure uh, the fluid is all out. Uh, I've had great success with vitrectomy alone and any additional uh, procedure you do, anything you add, you ha always have to think about the risk and benefit ratio. So um, I'm a minimalist. Gotcha. So, in, and does the age of the, the patient when they have this change your mind you did all, do you see for, I mean, so if, is this like 50 or 55 year old with a GRT versus somebody who is older? Does that change your mind about adding a buckle or not? Well, older patients are um, usually pseudophagic already, so that's even easier to <laughs> do a really good cleanup. <laughs> Fair enough. Excellent. Anybody else? Yeah, Yasha. I think the beginning of the surgery is sort of the crux of it, right, where, you know, uh, there was incomplete poster hyaloid separation in GRTs. And so, you know, there's a couple of times where I've done a GRT without a detachment and, like, said, oh, well, you know, it's Monday. We'll go to the OR on Wednesday. And then all of a sudden the GRT is, like, three or four clock hours larger than what it was on Monday. And I think that's just because as the vitreous continues to pull and unzip it. So using catalog assisted hyaloid elevation is arguably the most important part, whether or not you put a buckler or not. I think if you put a buckle, you just have to be careful that your buckle is not high mm -hmm. um, because you're risking slippage. 
And so sometimes you end up with much shallower buckle than you usually do in buckle bits. I think that's a really good point, and that's what we encountered here. We got slippage, and then I think because of the shape of the buckle, it's really hard to sort of get good laser. You're often fighting that angle. And if there's a little accumulation of fluid, as we sort of had here before, it's just it, it kind of works against you in some ways. So I think that's a good teaching point. Yeah. Mark, what are you going to say? You're looking at me funny, but that's something new. Uh, that's, that's not new. I've looked that way all my life. <laughs> Um, not a big fan of buckles. I uh, wouldn't buckle this. Uh, worried about slippage. Worried about slippage even without the buckle because, you know, you put the PFO in, it looks so beautiful, high fives all around, and like, <sighs> can I just leave it in? Um, you know, I've had a few patients where I leave it in for, for a week or two and then just take it out, and uh, sometimes that's the better option, I feel, because I want to put gas in this eye, but... Um, as soon as I put air in, I'm, I'm, I'm worried it's going to slip. So do I go directly from PFO to oil? I mean, I know that's nice, but then you buy the patient another surgery. So what's, what's, your, what's your feeling on this? So I, if I do a primary bit on these, it's a, slow, it's a slow drain at the edge. The most important part to me is the horns of the GRT. So making sure you get good laser. And then as you're draining posteriorly, stay at that posterior edge, uh, anterior, and just hang out, sing a song, sing a second song, sing a third song, make sure it's dry uh, before you go any, any further back. So that, that's why it's, it's time. That's, that's the most important thing, at least in, in my mind in, in, at that point. And uh, to, there are people who would uh, per, leave perfluorin in. I just met a patient uh, who has her perfluorin that stayed in her eye 20 years. She forgot to go back to have it removed. So that was actually kind of an issue. I'd never seen that before. It's pretty cool. Yes, has half her eye. Everyone's like, she's got silicone in the eye. I was like, nope, that looks like perfluoron. She had it 20 years ago. And she when tolerated it. Typical, it. How, does, you, how does your inferior retina look? Uh, she's attached. She looks awesome. Oh, <laughs> she's attached. She's attached really <laughs> she's well. She's got her retina alive. I, well, she's count fingers, but she's brisk count fingers. <laughs> Ret, retina <laughs> wins. All right, let's get to uh, Yasha's case. Yasha, you have an 84-year-old corporate lawyer with a reddish egg-shaped scotoma. I think, thank you for that description. Take us through this, man. Yeah, so he uh, received a bevacizumab injection uh, by a retina specialist and came to see me for a second opinion. His vision was quite poor, count fingers. You can see sort of the classic sub-ILM hemorrhage in the uh, central macula in sort of the settling of the RBCs and serum. Uh, and then a subhyoid hemorrhage inferiorly, and there's some degree of chronicity to it. You can start to see the blood is dehemoglobinizing, and superiorly you see subretinal hemorrhage. So you have blood in three layers, and then sort of following that art artery that comes off, you can see uh, that there's an elevation there. So here there's incredible amounts of shadowing from the subilum uh, hemorrhage. Uh, and you know the question when you're evaluating these is where is the blood? Is it all in the sub-ILM space? Is it in the subretinal space? Because if you look superiorly there, you can see that there is in fact some subretinal hemorrhage as well. And then you sort of this sort of helps you with your surgical planning as to are you going to be just removing the pre-retinal component to this, or do you need to have subretinal uh, hemorrhage displacement? All right, so let's ask this question: is, uh, Who's um, who's uh, taking this patient to the OR quickly? All right, there's lots of hands. Everyone wants to operate. Uh, well, you have to understand what, yeah. this po what this is, right? So even though the patient's 85, well, he actually yeah. put it at the bottom. I mean, with the hemorrhage is the way it is. This is RAM mm -hmm. right. until proven yeah. otherwise. So those patients, you know, Harry Flynn did a, did a big series on not operating on these cases, and they did remarkably well. So you've got to understand the reason for the subretinal hemorrhage uh, before you decide to operate. So yes, if sir. this is AMD, it's a totally different story. Yes, I, I was and about to ask why they get a bevacizumab because it wasn't. I didn't see AMD in the fellow. Yeah, I, I did not re-inject. Um, you know, I, I think a big part of it is, I, some people argue that RAM has some value in terms of reduction of intraretinal fluid. There's no strong evidence to support that. So I don't even if when somebody has a RAM and intraretinal fluid, I, I don't treat them with anti-VEGF therapy. Right. Well, All right, the interesting thing is, you know, the sub-ILM component should go away. And, and the question is, is, you know, if you go in there quickly, you obviously, you know, visually rehabilitate him faster, you know, to, to go in. The question that's really tough with the imaging is what's subfoveal from the subretinal hemorrhage part that you just can't. Well, you know, one of the interesting things, I was sort of talking with some of my colleagues about this, and, you know, we were talking, and, and so it's like sort of the blood goes to the point of least resistance. So you, if you have an excess of blood in the pre-retinal space, by definition, there's likely to be less blood in the subretinal space because you have a pressure gradient 
where most of it is in the pre-retinal space. And so that's why in these sort of like large, like uh, sort of egg-shaped sub ILM hemorrhages, you have like sort of a central area of pre-retinal hemorrhage, and then around it is where the sub, uh, sub-retinal hemorrhage is. All right, let's uh, take you to the video because we want to uh, uh, sort of uh, back to reality. Oh, wait, sorry, you, you wanted to show this. Go for it. You, I know you were excited about showing this. Oh, yeah. So I, I sort of love this because if you, anyone who's ever uh, like turned themselves into an imaging nerd knows that when you look at new blood on autofluorescence, it's dark. And when you look at old blood on autofluorescence, it's bright. And the rationale for why that is is because essentially hemoglobin uh, in the oxygenated form eventually breaks down into deoxyhemoglobin and bilirubin. And what you're seeing on autofluorescence is you're seeing bilirubin. And so that basically is because when you look at autofluorescence, you're looking at 488 or 514 nanometers. So it's the absorption spectra, which is maximally uh, sort of derived to bilirubin. But when you're looking at OCT, you're looking at actually just near-infrared imaging, whether it's the near-infrared image, which is 820, or the cross-sectional image, which is 870. And so that's maximally absorbent for oxygenated hemoglobin. And when you go through to the deoxygenated state over time, there's a conformational change in the hemoglobin molecule, and therefore you absorb less of that light. So just by proxy over time, as you go from oxygenated to deoxygenated hemoglobin, all of a sudden you can see the retinal layers deep to the ILM hemorrhage. So that, it sort of gives Yeah, you that's pretty great. Or you could just look at the fundus photo. That works also. So let's uh, <laughs> go um, uh, Let's go to your <laughs> surgical <laughs> case. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't resist, man. It was awesome. But like, can yeah, we just look at how beautiful. the eyes do it, bro? I mean, wait, oh, I'm sorry. The video, can you hit play over here? I think it's, it's oh. in the back. Yeah, there it is. Thank yeah. you. Go for it. Yeah, I should take us through, man. All right, so this is my fellow uh, Mina, who's an awesome retina surgeon and a really good dude, and he's uh, working hard to get the hyaloid up, which is kind of impressive for an 85-year-old to have such a, a taut hyaloid. Um, but here we're bringing it up. You can see there's some residual vitreous hemorrhage. We're using tissue blue to stain the ILM, and we create an inferior flap and then bring that up to the area of that bleb, and the ILM is significantly thickened just from the chronicity of that blood underneath it. And uh, what you'll see is eventually we'll kind of bring it up to the level of the RAM and then it, it sort of gets stuck there. And, and I don't need to peel the entirety of the IML, uh, ILM. All I'm trying to do is just create like a release valve, if you will. So we're just using the cutter to then shave down the ILM. And then just by doing a purple shave alone, the sub ILM hemorrhage uh, uh, goes away. Awesome. Nice job, man. And your OCTA, does it give us the answer? Yeah, so just show the RAM, but when you look there, like if you look at the foveal slice, you see that the temporal retina is dramatically thinned, and then if you go one, one stand below, you can see that there's normal th uh, thickness of the retina. So he complained considerably about a scotoma, and if you go to the OCTA, you can see that there's in fact a BRAO associated with this uh, RAM. So that's actually a rare complication of a RAM. It's kind of remarkable that when the RAM ruptures and you occlude the arterial, there's significant reperfusion that we don't get BRAOs. And this is the rare case of a ruptured RAM with a BRAO. They will. And there, Basil, we were going to show your case, but uh, Yasha went into the, you know, the imaging of blood. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to end uh, right, right 